This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everybody and welcome to a beautiful bright winter day. It's not a summer day, no, it's very wintry as you can see by dead trees and bright blue sky. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got a David. There we go. Thumbs up from David. And it is a very, very warm welcome to the school that is joining us this afternoon. I believe you are first time on a safari with us, which is very exciting. So Greenwood Elementary, lovely to have you aboard. And I hope that you're going to have the most wonderful time as we try and find all of the animals that we see down here in Africa. Now remember, it is interactive. So you guys need to ask as many questions as you can. And you'll give those to your teacher and she'll send them through to us. And we'll try and answer as many as possible. For all of our regular viewers, remember that we will get to your questions a little bit later after the school drive in about 45 minutes time and we'll give you the way to do that a little bit later. Now the plan is for this afternoon, I'm in an area where I'm trying to find a leopard. So we are looking for a spotted elusive cat. Sometimes can be very difficult to find. It's a young male leopard who lucky for us actually is not too shy of the cars or the camera and will spend a lot of time in this area this morning we followed his tracks for quite some time and so when I talk about tracks I'm talking about his footprints and so we followed his footprints for a little bit and we we've got a good chance of finding him so we're gonna try and see where he is and maybe he's lying under a bush somewhere just enjoying some shade it is quite warm this afternoon and there's a bit of a breeze and so I think if there's a good place for a cat to be it's going to be under a bush if we don't have much luck with him then well we're going to head to a big water hole that's northwest of us or east northeast sorry northeast of us where there's maybe going to be some ellies or other animals coming down to drink that's the idea anyway so that's the plan for this afternoon hopefully it will be a successful one but while I go and try and find my leopard I'm going to send you all the way to my friend who's very very far from me up in Kenya and she's driving around and wants to say hello to all of you from Greenwood Elementary. It's a very windy day out here in Kenya and we are in an area called the Mara Triangle. Now my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Archie and I'm so so excited to have you all aboard my safari vehicle and I'm lucky I've got the sports car. We've got lots of sunroofs you see Tristan can't do this. How cool is that? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have another look at the elephants which are just in the distance. Megs, I'm actually I'm sorry, I'm just really talking to Megan. I'm getting all the general comms updates. So there we have some elephants, we have the escarpment, we have a big storm brewing in the background, and you can of course hear all the wind. So I don't know how long we're gonna last, but sometimes the storms here in the Mara they blow over really, really quickly. And I kid you not, maybe about ten minutes ago, it was so hot. So 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 hot. There's not a, it's a beautiful day. There wasn't even any wind at all, but it's all just arrived. So we do know that there is a storm coming. We seem to have them in the afternoons here, but that doesn't bother the elephants too much. They don't mind it out. They actually covered in mud. So you can see that it was at one point, it was very hot today because elephants cover themselves in mud to try and cool themselves down. <laughs> Now, Tamari, you've asked if it's scary to be out on a safari. I don't know. Do I look terrified to you? No, I'm just joking. It is not scary to be out on a safari. Maybe for the first time you ever have a pride of lions walk past you or an enormous elephant like the ones we've been looking at come straight past your car. That can be a little bit scary because they are dangerous animals. But the thing you must remember when you come out on a safari is that the animals don't want to hurt you. As long as you stay in the safari car and you don't try and get their attention by... Or or doing something really silly, they'll ignore you. They've grown up, with, a lot of these animals don't know life without vehicles and people watching them on safari. So it's okay, and it just it's something to get used to. So all of the safari guides, like myself and Tristan and everybody else that's out this afternoon, it can be a little bit nerve wracking sometimes, but because we've done it so often, we're so used to it now, it doesn't really bother us. I'll even sit out in the bush and have a little siesta next to a pride alliance, how cool is that? <laughs> but hopefully, one day you'll all be able to come and visit us on safari. But anyways, it seems as though we're going to be showing you lots of different animals today. Off you go to Steve who has a giraffe. 
Good afternoon, boys and girls, and welcome to my segment of the I have got the tallest land mammal in the world, and this is the southern giraffe, and my name is Steve Falcon, which I'm joined on camera by Senzoom Kize. We're out in the African wilderness. Please feel free to send your questions through with your teacher. Let us know what you'd like to see. Let's go back to the giraffe, Sens. It's moving down. There's a family of them here, actually. There's more than one, and it, just like up in the Mara, it is very windy here today and very warm. Not normally that warm this time, but a little bit windy. It makes the animals a little bit scared out here because there's always lots of animals out in the wilderness trying to sneak up on giraffe, trying to catch them, such as lions. So when it's windy, the giraffe are extra, extra careful. But look at that very long neck. All the way into that bush and feed on the leaves. Very, very well adapted. They do look kind of funny, don't they? Long neck serves the purpose of getting very, very tall. Well, please, boys and girls, do us a favor and make a note of all the animals you see this afternoon. Let's see what we can get to at the end. And while we continue here with the draft, let's go over to my good friend Sydney, who's walking in the bush. A very, very good afternoon to you all students from Greenwood Elementary. I am Sydney and I am traveling with Craig. He is my camera operator this afternoon. For in case if you would like to ask us questions, you can ask that through your teachers. I will be doing the guided walk this afternoon much more towards the eastern side of the game reserve and I will be looking for the interesting tiny little animals. You must remember that here in Juma Game Reserve, we have got both big five and the small five. What are the small five animals? Kids, the small five animals are the animals whose names are consisting the big five, like buffalo weaver. A buffalo weaver is a bird. This bird has got a red beak and is black in color. We have got a leopard tota. A leopard tota is kind of a tortoise, which has got quite a lot of black markings on it. We have got elephant shrew is kind of a red which has got a very long mouth which looks like the elephant trunk and we have got what is called an ant lion. An ant lion is a very small animal which has got the mandibles. It uses these kind of mandibles in order to catch what they eat. And then we have got what is called a rhino beetle. A rhino beetle is kind of a beetle which looks more or less the same as a dung beetle, but it has got the two horns here, and those two horns are resembling the horns for the rhinos. Those are the kind of animals that I will be looking for this afternoon. So it is... So now let's see, Steve, one of my colleagues in the reserve, at the moment, he's got some monkeys to show you. Yes, well, they're not actually monkeys. They do look like monkeys. They are related to monkeys, and they're actually related to us as well. What we've got there is a family of baboons. The Chukma baboon, which we find pretty much all over South Africa. And they were busy playing up in that very big tree there behind that big one on the left. You can see by the leaves of the tree that it is very windy. And the baboons, they like to spend a lot of time in the tree. They feed in the tree, they sleep in the tree, but they actually do a lot of their activity on the ground. Look how well that one is climbing. They will sleep up there. They don't have very good nighttime vision, just like us. Uh, we have to go back into our houses at night and lock the door. The baboons will go up high up into the tree to hopefully get away from those prowling predators that you find on the ground, such as the leopard. But you see that big baboon on the left. Ooh, we're going to go up into the tree first. There we go. Can you see one? Sens is in there. That is a big jackalberry tree. There we go on the left, you can see big jackalberry tree and that tree has got very nice fruits 
It's actually called the pear of the gods, that tree. And the fruits are very, very tasty. Even us, we eat them. They're very, very tasty. If you can find a ripe one, most of them are quite green, but the ones that they're looking at now are probably quite ripe. And so that's what they're enjoying. And there'll be lots of activity in these big trees. And it's a beautiful tree for baboons to sleep in. See how many branches there are. They can run around in there as well. They're very, very good climbers, the baboon. Lots of games they like to play. They might chase each other around there a little bit. There's another one on the right. Look at that. Sitting so comfortably up in the tree. Reminds me of my little brother, in fact. Eating. Just sitting there. Plucking each fruit at a time. Always one of them with a view. Jamil, you know what time it is here? It's just gone after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Probably about 10 past 3 in South Africa. The Masai Mara is an hour behind us, I think. In here, watering hole. Uh, very important to have watering holes in and around. The animals like to drink. Not only do they need food, they need things to drink as well. And there is the big baboon on the floor. You often find big baboons in these groups. They're actually a gang of males that lead the troop around. And they're in charge of everything. And they've got enormous... Look at that one on the left. It's busy climbing. Could you climb a tree like that? Look at him. And there's an impala coming from the right. They like to spend time together because the baboon has got very good eyes. And they have a very similar predator in the name of the leopard and the lion. So if they see one, they will shout at each other. But see those two on the left are having a little bit of a game. They are the most fun animals to watch, baboons, because they're always doing something. And when you look closely, you can always see a little bit of your family in them, because they're always playing, they're always causing trouble. And then the dad comes into discipline and mum shouts at them. The younger one, or the bigger one, steals the younger one's food, or pulls its tail, or pushes it out the tree. Reminds me of my, my childhood quite a lot. Here we go, look how it's climbing there. I wonder if any of you boys and girls could climb a big tree like that. Whoops, and jump down it goes. That's fantastic. But they're sitting on the floor now because the tree drops lots of those fruits on the ground. And uh, that's what they're probably picking up. And uh, that one on the right was a bit bigger than the one that moved left. And so just by looking at him, he moved away. And the one that's come to the base of the tree is a lot bigger than the rest of them. Very long nose. They almost got like a dog-like face, but enormous teeth, much longer than a lion's teeth. Can you believe that? Their sharp teeth are longer than a lion's, so they can be very, very dangerous baboons. And uh, the big males forming a gang, as I was talking about, if they see a leopard, they will actually probably try to chase it, if there's a lot of males together, to protect the family, protect them against the predators. Here we go. That's how it's done. Climbing up little bit by little bit. I couldn't climb like that. I wish I could. Very, very strong in their hands. There's another one feeding on the left. All over the place. They're always oh, even eating the leaves now. What a nice view they've got sitting up in the tree. Very nice fruit. So omnivores... They eat fruits, they'll eat insects, uh, they might even eat small birds. Every now and again in the breeding season when there are baby impala around, we saw an impala just now, those big males actually sometimes go and grab the baby and eat it, but not all the time. And then they still hang out together, very strange behavior, because most of the time they're actually better to spot the predators than to steal their babies. But while we stay here with these baboons, we're going to go over to Sydney, who needs to keep his eyes open, because who knows what's out on foot. I have got one of the very much famous trees here in Southern Africa. This tree 
It is called the Tamboti tree. I just want to try and check something here because I can see that a lot of these trees already they are dropping the leaves, but this one still have got quite a lot of green leaves. This is one of the trees people are not allowed to come and harvest the wood for brying purposes. Apart from that, there is something as well you have to be careful of when it comes to the interaction with this kind of a plant. I am going to just see if I can pick up one leaf from this tree and show you something. It has got a very milky latex. You can see the, the latex is showing coming out. You must have to avoid by all means, you must avoid contact with this latex uh, with the eyes by all means because these kind of latex, they are going to irritate your eyes and you will have a lot of problem. You must also avoid ingesting or eating this kind of leaves if you eat it they are going to dry your gums and you are going to experience a lot of problems so these kind of branches wood borers some of them they come here but they don't necessarily bore this they just come and buy it so if you can take this branch from here to there and you take it and put it in a bag like a milli bag with the millets inside, you will see none of the insects are going to eat those millets inside. Once they sniff this branch, they're not going to go in there. So these kind of branches, you can use them in order to chase away some of the insects, even when the branch is dry. That is what we are doing. I come from Venderland, and in Venda, in order to chase these insects, when we are plowing the mealies, during the harvesting period, we put these small pieces of branches and put them in the bags, and we know that the mealies, they are safe in there. So I will be looking for more other small interesting things going towards the northern side now. So now let's see, let's see, Taylor has got lions as, as I'm talking to you now. How cool is this? Lions! And I have not seen this pride for a very, very, very long time. The last time I saw them, I think, was in February. And then I, I went back to South Africa for a few months. And now I've had the chance to see them again. I think this Pride Alliance is called the Mara River Pride. But there are two different groups that join together. Now, you can see the camera is shaking a little bit every now and then. It's because it is so, so windy. Archie's holding on tight. I've got to hold on to Archie's leg to make sure he doesn't blow out of the car. So there we go. And you can see that they are licking their lips. Some of them were yawning and they were doing a little bit of grooming. That's normally what lions like to do before they get up, before they start to move. So it's kind of like if you are getting ready for school, you have a shower, you brush your teeth, they're doing the same thing, but the lion version. Now, Andy, I don't think we're gonna be seeing any lions running just yet, because the reason why I think that they are waking up is to actually get away from the storm. I think they're gonna go into the forest in case it starts raining. The lions don't necessarily like the rain so much, but, Andy, when a lion is chasing after something like a buffalo, they can run really quickly. They can run anywhere between, I'd say, about 65 and 70 kilometers an hour, so it's really, really quick, but they can't keep that up for a very long time, unfortunately. They get tired quite quickly. So when these beautiful big cats have to hunt, just like the leopards, they've got to try and get as close to their prey as possible. And this is a really big pride. Look at that tiny little one. Hello, Fluffy. That's so small. Now, the ones that you can see in the top left corner, I remember they were only a couple of months, maybe maybe two or three months old when I last saw them. So February, March, April, May, June, July. Yeah, they're probably about between, I don't know, maybe eight months old now, maybe just a little bit less than that. But that's a tiny little fluff ball. And I think I saw two of them. And they look like they're probably around four months old or so. But they're so small. This is so cool. I don't even know how many lions are here these days, but I've definitely seen four adult lionesses. So that's what we call the girl lions, lionesses. See, there's one just sleeping now. And Alison, you've asked how many lions are normally in a group. Well, it kind of depends. So from the norm that I've seen, I would say 
They're normally about four or five lionesses in the pride, and then they'll have their cubs. So then you can end up with like, you know, 17 or 18 lions quite easily. But not all those cubs are going to make it to adulthood. So we call baby lions cubs. And so it kind of depends. I mean, if we look at this pride, which I think is the Mara River Pride, I think there are, I think there were five lionesses here, but we used to see three together and two would sort of separate and then come back. But um, we do get some big prides of lions out there. But I would say about five lionesses and then all their little ones. And then the boys, the males, they don't stay here for very long. See, they normally get kicked out from about two and a half, three years old. They get told to leave their home pride and they have to go and grow up on their own and eventually find, and, or find some, some lady friends that will take them in and then they'll become in charge, in charge of that pride. So the male lions that we see that spend some time with this pride of lions. There were three of them, or there were actually four big male lions that lived together. They're known as the triangle males or the Kichwa Tembo boys, but one died and then there were three. And then I've heard recently that there's only two left. No one really knows what happened to the third one. He Maybe he's moved out, maybe he got killed by another lion, maybe he died of an injury when he was trying to take on a hippo or a buffalo because those big male lions, oh my goodness, they like to eat hippos and hippos are very dangerous. They're one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. But I can't believe how big they've got. I wish I had a picture that I could show you to show you how small they were a few months ago. But this is amazing. Now, I may have found you lions this afternoon, but Tristan is the leopard whisperer in South Africa, and it seems as though he's got some tracks in the sand. I do indeed. So earlier I was saying we're trying to find tracks for a leopard in order to find it. And, well, you can see on the road there, there is a paw print right in the middle that is for a leopard. Now, this is for a male leopard. I don't think it's the leopard we are looking for. It looks a little bit big to be our young male that we were tracking this morning. This looks like maybe a little bit of a larger male. But there you can see it right in the middle of the screen. Now, you'll see that this cat has got four toes going forward so on a leopard track and lion tracks actually like Taylor's got you will see that there are four toes that will be in the front three of the toes are very easily seen on this particular track because you can see on the top right of it there are three little holes basically so those are toes the fourth toe is a little bit difficult to see and then there is a pad at the back now these tracks often indicates where a leopard has walked and what we use them for basically is to show exactly how the leopard has moved and then we can look at a few things to determine if these tracks are worth following because old and you don't really want to follow old tracks because that leopard can be a long way away so what we look for is we try and find tracks that are on the roads because the roads is easiest to look for and luckily leopards like to walk on the roads and so when you're looking for their track you try and see the toe area you make sure that there's no claws in front because if there was claws then you'd be following a hyena and not a leopard and then we try and see how many lobes they've got at the back also make sure that there's three lobes once you've confirmed it's a leopard then you start to look at more details because you've got to be able to tell whether it's fresh or old and so this track I think is probably from last night and the reason why I say that is because it's very windy today and so when there's wind what happens is as the wind blows little particles of sand so these little sand pieces they fall into the track and they make a little bit of a covering over the top of the track and so you can tell that they're not that fresh if it was something that was very very fresh if you look to the left of this leopard track here is my tire this is where I've just driven now you can see there the difference between that tire and the leopard is that the sand on the tire track is completely flattened there's no sand on top it's all squashed in whereas on the leopard track there's a few little bits of sand on top so these tracks are not very fresh they're not the tracks we're looking for we find tracks that are newer than this. We're trying to find tracks that are from today. I think these are probably from last night or even yesterday afternoon. So not the tracks we're trying to follow and look for, but it's always good to double check these things and make 100% sure because otherwise you're going to spend a long time following footprints and you're not going to get very close to that animal at all. But I'm hoping that this is a good indication that there is leopards around. Even though it might have been from yesterday and we know that the leopards can move, it's still a good indication that there have been leopards moving in the area and hopefully we'll be able to get lucky and find you a spotted cat sitting somewhere close by. We've had a very good run of things with leopard lately. 
So Taj, in lions and leopard in terms of their prints, well, the lions is so much bigger than a leopard's. So you'll find with lions, you'll be, get these big prints that are about the size of my hand, whereas the leopard print is only about the size of my palm. So lion prints much, much bigger. And also the toes on a lion, much larger and more oval. Leopard's toes are a little bit smaller and more rounded than the lions. And then on the pad itself, you find that the lions have more angles on their pad than you'll find on a leopard track. Now there's some very pretty little birds that look a little crazy that are on my left hand side here. They're called white crowned helmet shrikes and, well sorry, white crested helmet shrikes, I don't know why I said crowned. But these guys have very cool faces. They've got a little yellow eye with bright bushy grey heads and they fly around normally in groups together. So you normally see them in groups of four, five, or six, as many as eight or nine. And they fly from one branch to another and they're looking for insects. They are shrikes, which means they're predatory birds. And they've got that little hooked beak that they'll try and grab all kinds of food. All right, let's see now where our leopard has gone or come from. Neither the leopards actually have four toes, so in that track there you could only see three very nicely because the fourth one didn't show up nicely in the sand. So if you have a look at a normal leopard track, you'll get the four toes like that, which is common of the cats here in South Africa. You'll find if you the fifth toe is actually there, but it sits very high up. It sits almost on their wrist area, and it's called a dew claw. And that little fifth toe basically is helping when they're trying to grab all kinds of prey animals so when they're hunting things like impalas they're going to run along and they're going to grab it and this little claw here grips onto the animal so that if they miss with their paw it still gets a bit of grip and they're able to then pull the animal down so theirs is just recessed and that's why you don't see a fifth little toe like on our feet we've got obviously got five toes and so we make little five toe marks but on a cat it's only four and that particular track it was only three because the fourth one had stood on harder ground and so it hadn't made as deep a dent in the sand and therefore was a lot harder to actually see so sometimes when you're tracking lions and leopards you all you will see is one toe you won't even see the five I mean the four toes you won't see the back of the pad at all sometimes it can be very difficult but you know other times you get lucky and you'll get a situation like we just had now where you're able to see the track quite clearly on the road it gets much harder when they go off the road and into the thickets leopards are very small animals that are light and they don't leave the biggest of markings and not like lions lion tracks are much easier to follow than leopards all right well we're going to keep looking and trying to find our iconic leopard while we do that though steve has found another animal that is very iconic here in africa yes we have we have found the zebra this is the plain zebra and how beautiful are those stripes they are such gorgeous animals one of the, the animals that everyone who comes to South Africa or to Africa wants to see, giraffe and zebra. And boys and girls, add that one to your list because that is a very special animal to see. And they are related to horses, as you can tell. And they're horses with their pajamas on, it seems. And they're going to disappear behind the bush there. And moving a little bit to the left, I'm going to just go back a few meters and see if we can spot them again. And you'll actually see they are with some giraffe. Giraffe are nice and tall as we saw before and are nice to hang out with the tallest guys in the bush. I don't know if I can see the giraffe anymore. There we go, we got the zebra again. The giraffe a little bit off to the left. We might see them in a moment. But just like the baboons, the zebra like to hang out with giraffe. All these animals have similar sort of enemies trying to catch them. <clears throat> so when you're a zebra, you can feel quite comfortable feeding with your head down, eating with your head down, because the giraffe is looking all over the place with that very tall, long neck and very good eyes as well. Hello, Alison. You want to know what zebras eat? Just like horses, they feed on grass. They like nice, tall, sort of juicy grass, almost like hay, I suppose. And that is what they feed on. Um, the giraffe feeds on the leaves. There you can see the zebra's got his head all the way down and feeding on that dry brown grass all over the place. And that's why the watering holes are important because once the zebra's filled its belly with that grass it needs to come and drink because it's a very thirsty business eating dry grass. I've done it on a number of occasions. It's not very nice. But that is what the zebras do. 
and you see their tails are constantly flicking. Sydney was talking about the Tamburti keeping away insects. Well, these zebra like to flap away their tail to keep the flies away from their bottom. Jamil, they are born with stripes. They're just little mini, mini versions of the adult with a really long almost like they were put in the wash and shrunken with the wash if any of you have ever seen your mommy do that before with your favorite jersey well, that's exactly what they look like they shrink <laughs> and the stripes the stripes actually are important for keeping them camouflaged would you believe it look at that they just disappeared because of their stripes and their camouflage let me go back a few more meters and we will see the giraffe and the zebra together i hope Maybe not. I think the giraffe has moved off. Just like that, these camouflage animals can disappear into the wilderness. That is exactly what they're good at doing. Oops, it's a little bit bumpy. Let's see one more chance over here. Nope, it seems like they're gone. Well, that is it for the giraffe and the zebra for this afternoon. But we're going to head to a watering hole just down the way where hopefully we can find you some more very special animals. But we're going to go jumping back onto the bushwalk, back onto foot with Sydney. I managed to get hold of one of the small five. What I am having here is called an ant lion. This is the one which is representing the lion, which is considered the king of the jungle. So but this one, it means it's a little king of the jungle. So he's coming here and build this kind of final shape every morning. The reason for him to do this is not to stay in there. He's doing this in order to catch the food. This ant lion, the name is consisted of two different animals. He's talking about the ant and the lion. In other words, it's an animal feeding on ants. That is where this name ant lion derived from. So at least I managed to find one of the small five. Maybe I'm going to find more again and then we might complete the big, the small five. Not too sure. We do have all these small five in the reserve. So I'm just going to now share with you something interesting here. This kind of, of an insect is going to stay in here and after some time is going to grow wings and fly. It is a very small insect there and it's just passing through different stages. He's coming from the egg, and after the egg, he's gonna become a lover. When he's inside this hole is when he's doing his lover stage. After the lover stage, he's going to bear wings, he's going to do the pupa stage. The pupa stage is gonna take a while. After that, he's going to bear wings and fly, and then he becomes something which looks similar like the dragonfly. So this insect is magical. It's starting down there and is going to again compete with the other flyers and then you will see him flying looking for some other diet. The challenge is when he's flying he can only fly for about 55 days. He's going to spend almost three years when he's doing that lava stage but after that then he's going to fly. The ant lion is part of the small five and is from the ground and it end up flying. So imagine an animal that is doing both the terrestrial. Terrestrial, I'm talking about animals that are staying on the ground. He stays on the ground and after that up in the air he's going to fly. Interesting, isn't it? So let's see, maybe we might find uh, some more other interesting stuff, much more going towards this side. When we started, we thought we were going to go east, but now the plans has changed. Where I am at the moment, the wind is blowing. So let's see uh, what my other colleagues are having. I do have some of the colleagues who are in Kenya now. Let's see what they're going to show you. Hello and welcome back from on foot in South Africa to the Maasai Mara and welcome to the students joining us this afternoon. My name is Jamie and this afternoon a gentleman called Manu is behind the camera and the reason you haven't seen me the whole afternoon is because I've been, oh I found something, desperately searching for a hyena to show you which is what I've been spending all of my time with but I just found a lion. <laughs> 
Well, I'm not going to drive past a lion since you're here with me, so hold on one moment. Because I think he's the reason my hyena aren't here. Now, what we're looking for, well, what I'm looking for at the moment is a place to turn around. What we're looking for is an animal called a spotted hyena. Now, while other people get to follow prides of lions and all sorts of things, we'll get there, there we go. I have 70 hyenas to keep track of, or over 70 hyenas, that all live together in a clan, which is a group, what you call a group of hyenas. And in this particular clan, there's over 70 of them. You'd think, in this great open space, I'd be able to find one out of 70 hyenas, especially because they have their babies at a communal den site. But the truth is, I can't find them, and they're not at the den site. And I think that this over here is the reason why. Now, hyenas, usually in big groups, can take on a lioness, and they sometimes steal from lionesses when the lionesses have made a kill. But a hyena is afraid of a big male lion, and I think that's what we have here. Now, Megs, I don't know if you don't mind waiting for two seconds just so I can show you the line, because then I'm going to carry on. <coughs> or I'm quite happy. I don't know where he went. Where'd he go? I promise you I saw a line. Oh, has he gone down? Oh, goodness gracious. Sharp eyes from Manu over there. Have a look at that. Here we go. That, believe it or not, is a lion. Very far away now. And that, Asante Sana. And that is the closest, unfortunately, that we can get to him. I must have looked across just as he was getting up and moving. Sorry, everyone. I was hoping to get you a nice close view. Now, I think if I had to guess, I would say that this particular male lion is either a male called Scar or one of his coalition members. So one of the group that he hangs out with. Now, male lions group together. They aren't part of the pride. They're separate to a pride of lions, which is made up of females. Male lions group together either on their either in twos or threes or fours, sometimes on their own, and they hold a territory. And in that territory, they'll have a couple of different prides that they spend time with. <clears throat> and I think, given where we are, that this is one of the musketeers. So one of four male lions, and they're massive. They're absolutely enormous. Now, unfortunately, this isn't an area where I can drive any closer. But since we don't have the best view out here, I think what we should do is send you across to Taylor, who's also found lions in the Mara. They did exactly what I suspected they would do because the wind is just getting stronger and stronger. And they, don't, no, they don't like the wind too much. They don't mind the rain, except if you're a lion. Sometimes the lions can be, uh, I, I don't know, can we call them sissies? Because if I was a big, strong lion, the king of the jungle, I wouldn't let some rain bother me, but they don't like to get their fur wet, so they'll go and hide away in the forests. You can see there's just one little one sitting out there now all by itself. Oh, no, not for too long. It's going to follow the others into the forest. So you see that line, that line of trees over there? Now, that's a very special forest. There's not much of this type of forest left in Kenya, and it lines the great Mara River. So just on the other side of that is the Mara River. But unfortunately, the area surrounding the Mara River is very, very sensitive. So we're not allowed to off-road yet. So I can't take my car and drive it closer towards those lines. As much as I'd love to, I, and I can't. And I have to make sure that I respect that. And I, I want to try and conserve as much of nature as I can. So sometimes it's not necessary 
necessary to off-road all the time. And I think it's a good idea that those lions go and tuck themselves in and amongst all the trees. So we'll probably move from here. I think we're probably going to go and look for some black rhinos. Now, Kimari, you wanted to know if I've always wanted to live around animals like this. Yes, I wish I could be one with the lions and living in the pride with them. I'd probably get eaten if I did something like that. So, no, I'm quite happy to just view the animals from here. But it is pretty cool. It definitely has a lot of perks living out in the wilderness. I mean, this is my office. Basically, everything that you see around me is my office. I get to spend lots and lots of time out here watching animals, which is important because when you want to learn about animal behavior and to try and, well, I suppose, guess what they're going to do. Like I said to you, I think that they're going to get up and walk in the bush. If I was in the same spot, seven years ago, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you anything about these lions, just that they like to eat buffalo or hippos and things like that, but I would never have been able to anticipate their behavior. So that's basically what you learn, is when you sit and you watch animals like us, animals have routines, they start to do the same thing, and, and then you learn that way. So it's super, super important. Right. Anyways, like I said, we're going to try and find you a black rhinoceros now, but that means we need to go a little bit further to the east. Looks like the storm is clearing. Off you go to Steve, who has got one of the most beautiful birds. Yes, we do. We found for you an African fish eagle. And here we are, Chitwa Chitwa watering hole. And this is a very common bird to find around the watering hole because they eat fish. Uh, very similar to the American bald eagle. They are related, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see by the colors, there's definitely white head with the black body. And he landed on that little island there, and those two smaller birds that were around didn't like it very much and were busy trying to chase him away. But he's not going anywhere. He decided he's going to stay there because that bird on the right, which is called a lapwing, looks like it might be sitting on some eggs. It's very interesting. A little bit early in the year, but it's possible. That's why they were being so aggressive towards the fish eagle. But I know we only have a few minutes left of the, the school drive, so we're going to quickly look to the right of the bird there, into the water, and to show you some hippopotamuses. How cool are they? They don't often do too much. They like to spend most of the time in the water. And uh, they are actually just lying on the bottom of the water there. And uh, because it's very windy, they're keeping themselves in the water so as to keep themselves cool. It's quite unpleasant, actually, this wind. And now it's really unpleasant, blowing all the dust right into my face. Sorry about that, I can't see. I need my safety glasses again, Senzo. You can see the wind on the water. If you're a good sailor, you can see those wind streaks coming along when you're sailing. And you know when it's time to pull the sail in or not. The hippo have turned their head. They're also not happy with the dust that's coming from behind. Oh, there he goes. Turn his head back. Seems like he's resting his head on the back of the other one. Just to keep the head above water. Saves a little bit of energy. So they don't have to uh, keep themselves up using their own weight. And there's a youngster that's gone underneath. And it's probably going to go underneath again. See the level of the eyes and the nose. Oh, and another one's popped up on the right. There's a whole lot of hippos in this watering hole, but most of them are hiding. They can apparently hold their breath for about six minutes or so. I've never counted. There we go. Under he goes. And that'll probably be the last you see of him. And like the zebra, these guys feed on grass. They'll come out at night time, though, to go feed on grass. Oops, we lost one. To go and feed on grass, and they can walk very, very far away and then come back again. And they make these very nice pathways to and from the water that the animals like to follow. And it's very easy to follow the paths of hippos back to water. Very, very easy. You have elephants and all the antelope walking along. And it's often on those pathways that we find very nice tracks of predators like Tristan was showing you. So if you know your watering holes, you know where they're going. You check those, those, those trails to and from water and there's a good chance you might find fresh activity. Oops, they just keep dropping underneath. So 
Chitwa Lodge on the other side there where the guests have a very nice view of this watering hole. And there's some more hippos there. Underneath they go. One, two, three. <laughs> there the fish eagle is flying. He has got a very, very full throat. And off he goes into the tree. Well, Greenwood Elementary, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for your comments, and I hope you made a list of all the animals because I think you had a really good show this afternoon. And on that note, thank you, and we're going to go back over to Tristan, who's still searching for a leopard. We are indeed, Steve. We're still driving around, having a little look. We so far haven't had any more luck. We've just been checking tracks. It's amazing how many tracks there actually are for Hosanna all over the place here. So it will be nice if we can just try and find him in all of these tracks. I know Herbie's also here helping me out. So that's good news. He's a good weapon to have around. Now, for those of you that have joined us, we have finished with our school drive, which means now we want to hear from all of you. So hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you want to get hold of us but so far there's no fresh fresh tracks other than the ones that we had this morning so Herbie's on his way to the last track that we had which basically was in line with where I am now so this drainage section so I don't know if he's moved more or if he's just decided to find a nice shady spot somewhere here and is now sleeping we know with Hosanna he does like to nap a little bit so I'm sure he's napping somewhere in this general vicinity and then he'll might pop out a little bit later towards the dam so I want to go and check Gallego Pan quickly just to make sure there's no sign there if there's nothing there then I might come back this way we'll check behind the dam wall but there's no sign of him actually coming out so I think more than likely he's still there and so hopefully Herbie will pick up fresher tracks and be able to point me in a bit of a better direction as to where he wants me to look that's the idea anyway Romit, we may just find him crossing the road. I wouldn't be surprised if we do find him crossing the road. Maybe not right now. I think he's going to make a, what do you think, David? A five o'clock appearance at the dam camp. Five to 5.30 appearance on the dam wall. That's what I'm gonna go for. I think that's when we're going to see little Hosanna wandering down around that area. So if, if you guys are watching dam cam as well, make sure you look out for him. But maybe, you know, you never know. Maybe he'll kind of pop out somewhere there. Right, well, off to Gallego Pan we go. While we do that, let's send you back across to Steve, who's looking at probably one of the most beautiful birds of prey we have in South Africa. Yes, well, this fish eagle flew across the watering hole with a crop full of something. Can you see how distended the throat is there? Now, obviously, birds don't have teeth. So they will just swallow entire organisms or pieces of organisms whole and then inside the crop it sort of is a storage area. That's one of the things that allows many birds to take food back to the nesting site. I don't think they're nesting at the moment but it means that they can ingest or take a whole lot of food in and then fly away. And white back vultures are renowned for taking up to a kilogram of meat in their crop and then slowly but surely that will get either they'll regurgitate and break it into smaller pieces or do that at the nest for chicks or slowly but surely it'll go down into the gizzard where it starts getting ground down by the sort of mechanical process before going into the actual stomach for digestion so very very good and I'm happy because I managed to fix my binoculars trap while we were doing that so I'm um, back on track what a marvelous shot you can actually see how the skin is almost pushing through the feathers there right in the middle of that pouch and it's always something that I learned a long time ago and it's important to realize when you see vultures in a tree is if that pouch is distended it means that the vultures have fed so there's definitely meat or there was meat around but if you find certain species of vulture in a tree and that pouch is not distended that it means that they have not eaten which means there's very likely possibility that the predator is still on in location you can see how he turns his head like that that movement of an eagle's head is sort of facilitating that sort of binocular sort of zooming that happens I can't imagine what it must feel like to, to look at something and then move your head slightly and that entire image zooms in towards you. 
I mean, most eagles are generally thought to be derived from the golden eagle, and a golden eagle, they reckon, can spot prey items from a mile away. So sitting in a tree, looking down, and then you can spot them. But the fish eagle, always found in and around water, occupying all the watering bodies in South Africa. Hello, Rosalind. Do you want to know how big it is? Um, my maths is right off now. Let me, I'll, I'll, let me just double check because I don't want to get this wrong. They're not the biggest of the eagles. They're not the biggest of the eagles. And I'm going to guess they're about half a meter in height, maybe a bit more, but that's just a guess right now. Let me just double check for you. Okay, so the African fish eagle's size is um, 2.5 kilograms and you're 68 centimeters so it's almost there it's about 600 millimeters so just over half a meter in height 2.5 kg so about five pounds or so and the sex is very similar I've been told there's ways to differentiate them but the females are slightly bigger in size uh, but when you don't see them together, find it impossible to identify the two. You just don't get that scale. You don't get the scale for size. But we often find them here in and around Tristan Watering Hole. And I've heard something on both radios in my ear, and we're going to go to Well, yes, a special surprise hidden in the shade of a jackalberry is this little spotty coat, and it is none other then little Hosanna, who's having a break on top of the termite mound. So we knew he wasn't too far from this area. It was just a matter of time until we found him. And our plan to go towards Galago Pan paid off because he followed that drainage line over Mvubu Road and then came up into this area and he's been lying on the mound. It was not actually very easy to see him at all. Normally I scan this jackalberry because I'm convinced one day I'm going to see a leopard in it and luckily just saw the kind of flick of his tail more than anything else it's not an easy spot that he's lying in if he puts his head up it's quite nice but when he's lying flat like that it's a little bit harder but isn't that really nice to have I'm super chuffed that we've managed to find him this afternoon it was a bit late for the schools unfortunately but at least we managed to find him Francis from Israel, you say yay with millions of exclamation points. Well, yes, it is very cool, isn't it? It is always nice when we find our little prince. And I'm pretty sure he is going to go to the dam at some point during the course of this afternoon. He's just waiting for everything to settle down and for it to get a little cooler before he decides to probably wander down towards the dam and have himself a nice drink. And maybe it's to start hunting again. I did actually see two little dikers not too far from here that he can potentially go after so he does have some prey animals nearby and that bodes well for our prospects for the night and well your prospects too because if he's around we know that he hunts quite a lot at the dam camp and so for all of you that want to watch him hunt into the night if he doesn't hunt this afternoon that's a prime place to be able to do it but isn't it nice to have him again you can see his telltale little nick out of his ear so if you were wondering how we know it's Hosanna given he's so flat one is his size of his paw is much bigger than a female's but two if you look on his ear there his left ear has got this little V that comes out the easier ways to be able to tell it's Hosanna and be able to pick him up so that's very cool to see shame he seems as though he's tired he's had a big few days hasn't he? he's had to deal with his sister and her daughter which is difficult to describe because theoretically it could be his sister too now the other day we were talking about relatives and I say it could be his sister too because they theoretically share a father so even though he is a sister to Tandi because they share a mother he's a, his sister Klalamba is also a sister because they share a dad does that make sense somehow I don't know but it's all convoluted and quite incestual at this stage so hopefully if at least he's not kind of mating with her at this stage. That's at least one saving grace, although it might happen. The way Hosanna is going and the way he's been able to charm Tingana into staying here, soon he is going to start getting into testosterone-filled mood where he's going to want to start mating a little bit. And whether or not Tingana actually 
keeps him here or allows him to stay here is going to be quite interesting at that stage. There's been a few relationships like this over the past few years in the Sabi Sand. So there's been Kampayan and Two Tones, who was a male, it sounds funny, but Two Tones male was another. Those two used to be seen together. In fact, they even mated with the same female at the same time, which is pretty odd. So one would mate with a female and then walk off a little bit, and the other one would mate with the female, which is quite quite interesting. And that was a father-son. And then there's also Masha Ben and White Dam male currently that are the lower parts of the Sabi Sands around Sabi Sabi and, and that area. So, you know, it does happen from time to time. And wouldn't it be great if we had Hosanna as our dominant little male leopard on a Juma? He won't be little for much longer, though. He's already bulked up quite a bit. And I think he'll probably, in time, get quite a lot larger as well as he goes through the years and starts to get a little bit older. Right, now, Hosanna is... Oh, hello, boy. Have you woken up a bit? Isn't that a cool face? Just a little wake up from his slumber. Probably the wind is also just waking him up ever so slightly. There's going to be another car that's going to join us as well, so I wouldn't be surprised he woke up a little bit for that. But while Hosanna rests ever so nicely on the ground, it sounds like Sydney is copying Hosanna's ways and is also lying about in the grass. I have got one of the very interesting evidence here on the ground. I can see that there has been an animal who died here some time ago. And this, I think, is something that happened towards the beginning of the dry season. When looking at this evidence here, this animal has been the milliped. I know a lot of people, they do have a lot of confusion between the milliped and the centiped. So the centiped and the millipeds, they are completely two different animals. Here comes the difference. The milliped, let's look at this very big segment here. The milliped, they have got a round body. And the centiped, they have got a flat body. The millipeds, they have got thousand legs look look at the legs i'm just gonna this these are the legs they have got they've got approximately thousand legs and the centipedes they've got hundred legs milliped they have got they are the millipedes they are poisonous and the centipedes they are venomous if you eat the milliped is when you are going to have problem because they are poisonous. But some of these animals, they do eat these kind of animals. Animals such as the civet. If you can check by the droppings of the civet, during the summer season, you will see these kind of segments right there. This poison, this milliped has got, is for them in order to fight against the small predators. Small predators such as ants. Ants, they always attack these very big, big, big animals. And for them to avoid them, they have got something here. Let me just grab this for you. They have got something right here on the side of their bodies, from the head to the tail. So this body can be long up to 35 centimeters. They have got something which is called the metallistic glands. And once these glands are sprayed, the ants, they've got to move away and be at a distance of about three centimeters. So these kind of, 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 uh, of, of animals are very much interesting. And what do they feed on? They feed on the decaying material. And when the decaying materials are about to finish, that is when they start to attack the living plants. So it's very much difficult to see them by this time of the year because they are hiding. They can survive up to seven to eight years. Some, some of them can be even more than that. So now at least I've got something that I haven't seen for quite a long time. And something I like the most about them is this. I'm going to imitate something. When they are irritated, by the insects. This is what they do. You will see them going like this. You will see them going like this. They go like this. When they are going like this, it's when they are confusing their predators as if they are snakes. They do mimic the snake movement. And the predators, they think, now it's not a milliped. I didn't see it right. It was a snake. Otherwise, they are going to coil protect the underneath parts because underneath is where it's very much soft and ants can easily catch them from there. So I will carry on in this area and search.
I didn't copy that question nicely, FC, if you can repeat it. I didn't copy the question nicely because of the wind here where I am, but I can hear that is the, the millipede turning white. These millipedes, there is different uh, there's different species. Some of them, they remain black. And some of them, you will see their colors are more light brown. So it, that is determined by the type of species you are seeing. Here in Southern Africa, we have got black and brown ones. I haven't seen the white millipedes. Maybe they are occurring in some of the areas that I haven't been before. So these kind of animals can be very much interesting. Uh, safari uh, South, the animals that are feeding on these kind of uh, uh, animals, millipedes, is the civet. The civet can be able to eat them, and some of the <clears throat> of the birds I have seen also the chickens. They also catch some of the millipedes. It was a very good question to ask Sally. So let me see if I can find something again here. It's quite very difficult to find these tiny little stuff. So I'm trying by all means to search each and every place here where I am now to see if we can find something. So now, while I'm still searching, you can, we can see uh, Tristan has got Hosanna. Let's see how he's doing. Well, he's a sleepy cat at this stage. I suppose he has just come off a kill. He was eating yesterday evening, and or most of yesterday. So he's still quite full-bellied from that. You can see his tummy's quite swollen. I was looking around for any sign of a kill somewhere in this big jackalberry in the bowels of it, but I don't see anything. So I know a lot of you thought you heard a diker being killed this morning, which is why I was wondering if maybe this is why he chose this spot, is because there could potentially be some sign of a kill here. But we can't see anything. We've checked under the bushes. We've sort of looked around. I don't see any signs as yet. It's not to say that he hasn't got one. So we'll just keep a lookout for that. And I was thinking thinking about it I was wondering what sound it could be I know somebody actually did send me a clip of it and I just haven't had a chance to listen to it yet today but I, I mean it could have been a few things there might have might have been another leopard that grabbed a diker somewhere around here and, and we just haven't seen it yet it's very very possible and talking about leopards on diker kills it sounds like Shadulu is actually on a kill somewhere in Hoffmans and so that's where she is which is a nice sort of update on her the leopards are specific trees that they like yes so any tree that's got a nice flat horizontal branch so things like jackalberries um, marulas uh, what else cape ashes figs anything where there's a nice branch that they can lie on that generally has a little bit of shade so you'll see now in the in the winter months very few marulas are used by the leopards unless it's to store a kill and get out of the way of hyenas very quickly then they'll go up into marulas but most of the time they're trying to find shady trees and that's why Hosanna has been using that jackalberry so much near the dam even though it's not the closest tree it's a much easier tree to go to because one is he can put it in there and it hides a lot better so things like vultures and lions and those kind of things they're gonna to have to really look in order to be able to spot it and be able to find that kill and so that's why he'll do it but two it's also if they're lying up in there it's a lot shadier and a lot easier in order to rest and not get so hot if they go into somewhere where there's a big mar marula at the moment where there's no leaves the Sun just bakes them all day long and the meat itself goes rotten much quicker and so it's just a much better situation to be in those so it's, it depends on the time of the year, but anything that's big with big branches that they can comfortably lie on and they can support their kills and, and a bit of foliage as well on the tree it certainly helps with things as well. Right, well, Hosanna is going to probably have a long nap this afternoon. He's going to wait for that sun to get a little low before he moves, so we'll be patient with him. And while we are, let's send you back across to Steve, who's looking at something that Hosanna hasn't quite managed to get right in terms of catching just yet. Yes, well, with the, the little chief, we have no idea whether he has or not 
managed to catch a water buck. He is just that character that who knows what he's done when no one's looking. But we've left Chitwa Watering Hole and I'm surprised that Tristan managed to find Hassan this afternoon because he's actually been with me the whole afternoon. We had um, some viewer visits this afternoon, Sue and Sydney, they came through from California. They were staying in Nkoro and um, they gave me a very nice gift. They know I love Hosanna and so they gave me the, the cutest little teddy bear. Now I can join James in having something on my pillow every night. How cute is that? Anyway, he's going to sit here and watch the show. Now Taylor has got an elephant and I've got a leopard. I don't know if he's going to be on every game drive. I'm just not really like that. But um, very marvellous that they brought those through for us. And all sorts of other gifts and chocolates and things that ladies in FC are supposed to share with us when we get back. Senzo's laughing. Share with us. <laughs> But this is a fantastic herd of water buck that's moving through here. Let's just try to get a little bit up again. A little bit of a gap. Okay, there must be 20, 25 of them. Not a single male in sight. Moving through the long grass. They've moved from Chitwa Watering Hole, no doubt. And they're moving out, ranging out into the pastures. Quite nice tall grass here. They are bulk feeders. They feed on a, a huge amount of grass every day but they need to drink. They never go more than a, a kilometer and a half or so. So half, what, 700, I don't know what you'd say, yards, 700 yards or so from, from watering point, 800 yards. It's not very far at all, is it? But there is one male that I always see not far from where they are. We are on the cheetah cut line now, so just sort of west of where they are now. On the other side, there's a really big male that just a few weeks ago, it might even be longer than that now, time seems to, to melt it away. No, I haven't seen the, the male now. Sorry, Sens. And um, we were following Tingana not far from here on the west of these animals, and he had a look at the big male water buck. I think he had a thought, but he's like, no, nah, there's no chance. There's no chance you better take an animal that size. I have seen a leopard with female water bucks up tree, up trees before. He was quite a big male, but an enormous feat to be able to do that. They're more than twice the weight. But anyway, we're going to go from one bulk grazer down here in South Africa that's enjoying lots and lots of grass. They enjoy lots of water. They have stripes, but only one on the bottom. Taylor in the Mara has got one with stripes all over. Hello again everyone. <laughs> I don't know why it's felt like being really awkward, so there we go. My awkward segment for the day. Whew. I don't know why I'm so out of breath from doing just one of those, but anyways, that was awkward. Archie always tells me off that he says I must do more. What must I do, Archie? More squats and more running around. Because as you can imagine, for this amazing series that we're doing at the moment, of course, Safari Live, the gauntlet, there's a couple of times where I've been walking around, I've had to step up things, and it must be because of the altitude here, but at the end of it, I can't say my lines because I've said a whole sentence and then I go... <gasps> And breathe. So anyways, so I'm going to take you to one of my favorite spots soon. We just having a quick look at the beautiful plains and the zebra. I'm going to get out of your way now. Bye bye. <laughs> and we were really lucky this afternoon because the storm went straight over the top of us and it actually, you can see, look at the dark skies on the escarpment on the oh la la la, because I bet you all have missed saying that word. It went straight over the top. I wonder if camp got any rain, but we didn't, which was nice and the wind is starting to settle down a little bit and I'm sure all the prey species are very happy about that because now they'll have a better chance of smelling and hearing any predators that could come towards them but the light is really really turning quite nice now I do like it when we have the dramatic clouds on the escarpment Malcolm now these species of zebra are the same species that we see in South Africa this is the the plain zebra it's just you don't see that shadow stripe so sort of prominent um, sometimes you can see it on some of the younger ones I've seen some that have got very prominent shadow stripes and the majority of them don't have any but um, the giraffe are a different species so the giraffe that we get in South Africa versus the giraffe in Kenya um, and specifically here in the Mara Triangle the Masa Mara National Reserve of course the Maasai giraffe and they're bigger than the southern giraffe otherwise oh what else the uh, waterbuck 
subspecies, the Defusa, it is the Defusa, hey? I'm not, I'm not making that up. No, it is, that's the species of waterbuck we, is it? I'm now, I've now gone completely blank. How's that? They're different. <laughs> Geographically, they're different. Um, what else do we have that's sort of different up here? The Impala are the same. Those ones over there, they're Apicerus Malampus Malampus. The only difference, of course, between the South African ones and the Kenyan ones is that they get much bigger here. And that's because of all the food that's around. And then the females also aren't particularly seasonal when it comes to giving birth. I mean, I've already started to see some young Impala lambs, and then they have a bit of a break and then they give birth again in August and then in December so when there's lots of food around and the conditions I suppose are quite good there, there's no need to have a, a seasonal sort of birthing season like we have in South Africa obviously the winters are quite dire in the Sabi sand of South Africa there's very little food around and you don't really want to have any youngsters about when you don't have lots of food and water but here is the, this is the land of the plenty basically and it's stunning. Now we're slowly starting to see all the zebras arrive, which is quite nice. And um, one morning, I think it was my first morning out, I went out with Manu and we came to Quechua Crossing, which was quite cool. And we just saw thousands and thousands of zebras streaming in, um, not quite into the triangle, but in the Masai Mara side. So this is some of them that have crossed at Quechua Crossing, which is quite nice over the past couple of weeks. Anyways, it seems as though the young prince has decided to wake up. He has indeed, so he just gave us the most beautiful show, busy grooming and licking and doing his thing, but he's now off and on the move, and it looks like he's going to go northwards and head off into a thicket, so we're going to try and just reverse out of here and not cause any damage to anybody. David, can I turn your side? So we're going to try and just get round. Rexon is here with me. so. Hopefully we'll be able to get through. I'm pretty sure we'll be all right as long as we can make it round this bush. So just saying hello to Rex quickly because Rex has joined us and Rex is always such a help when it comes to finding animals and always does a lot of effort for us to actually find what we need to find. So it's always good just to Say hello to him. Well, there's Hosanna. Surprised he's walking the way he's walking. He's going the r different way to what I thought. He's going northwards at the moment. So he's heading towards this area that I didn't think he would go to. But I'm going to just stop here because he should come out onto the road pretty much in this area. And I don't want to block his way. So if he's got space, he can come up on the road and walk past us if he wants to. But doesn't he look magnificent? Here he comes. Hello boy. Now something I've noticed with Hosanna of late, which is quite interesting, is that before he left and before he went off on his little jaunt down to Londolozi, he used to be a cat that walked on the road quite regularly and he'd cover the roads pretty much as he walked. He didn't really go off roads. He used to just walk down them as though they were natural to him. What's happened since he's come back is he very seldom walks on a road. He's now just crosses roads, much like what you just saw now. He crosses over and then he goes into a thicket. And every time I've tried to track him, it's been the same thing. He's never actually walking down roads for long periods of time. And that's a technique that females often use to stop others following them, particularly hyenas. When they've got cubs, they won't walk on roads. They'll just cross roads so that hyenas don't pick up their scent very easily and follow them. And I wonder if he's doing that because of the other leopards that are around, if he's just using it in as a way to stay nice and safe. Right, so let's just try and catch up with him quickly. Like I said, very surprised the direction he's heading. I didn't expect him to go this way at all. I expected him to go more towards the dam, but maybe he spotted something from up on that mound. That mound is much higher than what we are, and so much easier for him to see something. And like I say, maybe he spotted something here that he wants to try and go and hunt, or he's just having a little wonder around. Maybe he's going to go to Gallego Pan for now. It would be better if he went to the dam camp, obviously, because, like I said, it allows all of you to be able to watch him. But you know, sometimes he likes to do things a little different differently and I suppose he has really been spoiling us on that dam that it wouldn't be a surprise if he goes to another one but his posture has changed doesn't it it looks as though he's almost stalking and the other interesting thing is probably why he's walking the way he is is that the wind is gusting from the north at the moment and so that means he's walking into the wind now which is not going to give him away nearly as easily than if he walked 
the other way. If you walk the other way, many of the prey animals are going to smell him before he gets there. Whereas now, when he walks into the wind, the smell of those prey animals is wafting to him rather than the other way around. So it's potentially why he's doing it. I don't see any sign of an antelope anywhere near here. I don't see any view of something that he could be hunting. But his body language has changed. He's become a little bit more aware. You can see how he's kind of looking. Although now he's just popped his hips down and is going to have a little watch around first. Amazing camouflage these cats have though, really not that easy to be able to spot them when they move a little bit like this and they go into the shady thickets it can be very difficult. Oh Justin that could be anything, it's very difficult to say where that nick has come from, it, it could be a thorn when he was chasing after something, could have been when he was playing the shongile um, back in the day when they were cubs, I know he's had it for quite some time so it could have been that, it could have been when he got, when he's interacted with other leopards, maybe Tundi or Shadow latched out a little bit and gave him a little nick on the ear, you know it's difficult to say where that came from, it's very common though that leopards get little nicks in their ears and that's not a huge one so like I said, it could have been an, a thorn or something like that, or a little branch that clipped him on the ear when he was playing or running around. We know that he's a rather active cat, and when he and Shongile were together as cubs in that period when Karula disappeared for the first sort of two months, the two of them used to play around all over the place and run up and down together, and so I wouldn't be surprised that's when it took place. I'm pretty sure some of you will know rough time estimate as to when it, when it happened, but I know it's, he's had it for quite some time. It's not a new thing that he's just gotten since he's been away. He had it before he was away as well. What are you smelling? You can see his nose is to the air, definitely trying to pick up anything on the breeze. This is how leopards and lions will be able to hunt. We saw that very well the other day when we were watching the Inkuhuma Pride. It was absolutely still and the entire Pride was sleeping all cuddled up together on a cold morning and as soon as that wind just gusted through out of nowhere the entire Pride stood up and walked. So it does get cats moving when it's very windy particularly if they pick up the scent of a prey animal nearby. Masana, what are you up to? It just looks as though he's a bit undecided as to what he actually wants to do. I hope this is not him venturing too far and I hope that he's not going to carry on walking north because if he walks north here steadily for 15 minutes he's going to end up going into Biffle's Hook very quickly towards Tamburti Dam. So I hope this is just him sniffing about and having a little look around. What's he doing there? Maybe he does have a carcass here. Looks as though he's got his head in the ground. No, he's just sniffing around. He's come to us. So he's just watching. I wonder if he's looking for any sign of a prey animal. So just stopping and listening and scanning the area just to try and see if there is something that he can potentially hunt. I know that Tax told me this morning, late this morning, he found tracks for a female leopard heading towards Gallego Pan. So maybe there's another leopard somewhere here that he's sniffing or has spotted. It wouldn't surprise me if Tundi's about. I know Tundi has been in this area many, many times. And in fact, we are very close to where Tundi and Shongile had that massive fight, which was the last time we saw Shongile, actually. So we're not far from there at all. And Tundi does spend a lot of time walking in this area. But his way he's looking, it seems as though he's interested in something. What it is, I cannot tell you. I can't see anything myself, but that's not to say... There isn't something somewhere in this general vicinity. Hello, boy. <laughs> Such a good face, that little cat. Petru, difficult to say. It's it's so random for all leopards. You know, we don't we don't see a pattern gen generated by every single one that does it the same, but. In theory, and, and if we take a rough average, he normally will start challenging for territory. They normally become territorially dominant. Between sort of four and six is when they start normally taking over. Some leopards show displays of dominance much earlier. The leopards that I was talking about earlier, two tones and white damn male. White damn male was two and a half, I think, when he mated with his first female, which is around the age that Hosane is now. And so it is possible that he could start trying to, to take a territory. What's interesting with him is he's definitely scent marking, so he's been spraying bushes and rubbing up on them, hasn't started scraping his feet just yet, and is definitely not calling yet, but he's showing signs that he's 
marking an area and that behavior is starting to kick in and as he gets bigger and stronger and older so he's going to start more and more testosterone is going to flood and that instinct to start setting up a territory is going to kick in so we'll see I mean I think he's going to be an early bloomer given he was left so early by his mom he's going to definitely have to try and become dominant a little earlier than maybe some of the other leopards that tend to stay with their moms for long periods of time. I remember there was a male leopard down at Singita called Shinzele, and Shinzele stayed with his mom until he was about three and a half, four years old, which is very old, and then he left and only managed to get a territory just after five, whereas Hosanna obviously is on his own since he's been just a, about one years old, and so that means he's going to have to go a lot more until he can actually get a territory but you can see he's right by the vehicle it's got absolutely no no shyness when it comes to vehicles and being around them he's definitely kind of slinking about as though he's spotted something I'm trying to just look around i don't see anything it's a great place for a lot of animals uh, that hang around here get a lot of impalas a lot of nyala um, dikers bushbuck that all come down to the camp to drink and also use the safety of the camp in order to um, go and feed so it is a good place to hunt and it's a, an area that many leopards have utilized we know Mvula used to hang around here a lot Tingana comes here a lot Tandi uh, Karula used to use this a lot as well so it is a good area for a leopard and a good place to find food and in fact when Shangila and Hosanna were little cubs they actually did spend a bit of time in this general vicinity as well where are you going Hosanna what have you spotted I wonder if he's not spotted a little Franklin somewhere in this bush because he's looking right into the bush very close by. He's also watching the tracker a little bit just to see what they're doing. Too curious, this cat. I don't want to move though because I'm sure he's watching something. Could also be just the grass rustling all over the place is catching his attention and he's a little unsure of everything. It's almost as if he's glancing to the car to say, are you watching? Because I'm going to give you a show now. So make sure you're watching because I'm going to pounce soon. But isn't that amazing? He really is a relaxed individual. It baffles me how calm he is around vehicles sometimes. Look at that. He's just creeping in there. What have you found in there, Hosanna? Nope, decided that there's nothing to pounce on there. Off we go again. I think he's in hunting mode though, that's for sure. I think he's decided he's going to try and find some food and use this wind to his advantage. Beautiful though, a little bit of that side light that's coming through, just kind of highlighting his profile. Very pretty. Yes, come say hello to us, Hosanna. We want to say hello to you as well. There he comes. I'm just wondering, I have a feeling there's something here that he's spotted that we just haven't picked up yet that he's slinking about the way he is almost looks as if he's now trying to get into a better position can't see anything though often impalas in this area at this time of the day you often come in to this section now david i know you've lost him so just give me two seconds because he's right behind this tree So we're going to just reposition ourselves ever so slightly just to try and allow for a bit more space for him to walk and for us to be able to follow him as he does walk. Don't worry Hosanna, we're not going anywhere. Kind of gives you this forlorn look when you sometimes when you leave him. He kind of just looks at you with these big puppy eyes and just kind of stares at you and says, where are you going? You're not allowed to go. Now Wendy is doing its normal stalling technique. There we go. So there he is. Isn't that beautiful? Right, well, while we see what Hassan is up to and who he's actually stalking or looking around for, let's send you back up to the Masai Mara and to Mr. Scotty Dyson, who I'm not sure we've actually seen in the last few days. 
Hello everyone and welcome back up to the open plains of the Mara. Exciting stuff over there with Tristan and Hosanna. Well, this is the most exciting it's been for us today. We have been sitting where we are since about 9 o'clock this morning. And the reason we've been sitting here is because we have been waiting for Naratoy and her young boy to poke their head out of the grass not far away from us. My name is Scott. It's great to have all of you on board with me again. And I'm teamed up with James on camera. So like I say, uh, Naratoy, who is a cheetah, and her son are lying uh, in a small bush over here. And they've been here since, like I said, 9 o'clock this morning. Brent found them first thing this morning, so some of you would have been lucky enough to see them on the Sunrise Safari. But since we came into the sighting and took over from Brent so that he could start looking for the Sausage Tree Pride, they have been sleeping all day. Which has actually come as quite a surprise because they weren't looking too hung or they weren't looking too full-bellied, rather, when we came across them. So I would have expected them to be searching for a meal during the course of the day, but not just yet. And at this stage of the evening, it's getting a little bit late for them to start hunting, especially in the area that we're in, because other than the zebra that we're looking at, there is not much prey in the area. Not many Thompson's gazelle. The Thompson's gazelle tend to go into the areas with the short grass, and as you can see, there's not much short grass around us here. Now, another interesting thing that I'd like to show you I am still looking for the interesting small animals and I have been looking all the way from down that side and here where I am now I have just picked up an alarm call one of the Franklins just gave me some of the signals that uh, there is something happening around here so I am hoping to pick up something here where we are not too sure and according to my game scout habit eh, we are suspecting that Tandy and Kalamba are somewhere deep in these bushes where the audio was coming from they didn't make any noise but the birds are talking to us about the presence of one of the predators in the area at the moment. So now I'm just going to investigate and see. Andy, my favorite season is the summer season. If you look at this vegetation, during the summer season, it is all going to be just green and all the insects will be back. Reptiles are all going to be here. Everything is going to be here for me to talk about. Now, during the dry season, it's quite a bit difficult for me to find you the interesting small creatures. So I'm just going to try and track a little bit and see here what has been there. So let's try and check what's still here on the ground. Maybe we might... Oh, I've got something interesting here. Oh, my first ant nest. Look at that. This is beautiful. They're all now going down there. You know, the ants, we always see them walking. Look, we always see them walking. They are coming out there, you see. They are bringing the, uh, the, the soil particles out. It means they are building. So if you look at these ants, look at the size of the body. The interesting thing about these ants is that their stomach is on the same position as us. Their stomach is after the waist, which means the ants cannot be able to eat solids. For them to eat, they must go out and then they take this food. When they come back to the nest, you will see they give that food to their lovers. The larva, they are able to eat the solids. And after that, they must secrete the fluid. And that fluid they are going to secrete is the fluid which is rich in nutrients. And this termite ants is what they are going to eat. In other words, in other words, this kind of, in, of an insect, they cannot survive without a queen. If the queen dies, you will see the whole ant nest is going to die because there won't be any lava anymore because the queen is the only one responsible to lay eggs. No lava, there is no life for the ants. For them to eat, the food has to be eaten first by their lovers. So now let's see what is happening on the other parts of the game reserve. Well, we're still with 
the little chief and he's where are you going you can't walk there you're walking straight to the car what are you up to today hello boy I don't know why he keeps changing direction and coming towards where we are but it's a really interesting behavior that I've been watching him he goes to every single bush at the moment and looks in under the bush I don't know if he's trying to see if he can disturb scrub hares or maybe dikers that are sleeping underneath there that's what it looks like because he keeps going and kind of sniffs around at the base of thickets and so normally when you follow leopards or any cat is you'll try and find a way where they're gonna walk on a path and you stop back and normally it's in line with some sort of thicket vegetation because they don't go to the thicket they normally will go past it on the pathway that they're following but it's difficult today because Osana are you talking boy it almost sounds like he's he just called but it didn't and and they normally kind of go past and they don't actually come to the thicket but he keeps coming to the thicket so it's making following him a little on the tricky side because obviously we don't want to disturb him in any way or go anywhere near where he's walking but he keeps changing direction right at the car which is making it a little more tricky in many respects so I'm trying to not get in his way but it's almost like he keeps walking straight at us which is quite interesting Jamie I, I mean it's obviously very difficult to know for sure um, whether or not he's he's forgotten about Karula but I, I mean I don't know he could have I, I would imagine so I mean I imagine he's just getting on with his life now I do need to give the guys an update quickly no negative there's one more fuzzy that is lying up at uh, on the Viertela side of Triple M to just opposite one eyed Pan Road so so just trying to help the guys with a sighting that they want to try and go to but you see now he's going back the opposite way again. Wasana, what are you up to, boy? He's going to walk right behind us. I'm going to try and turn you, David, so that you don't have to stress too much and don't have to pivot round with all the aerials. So I'm just trying to help Rex there because he's just asking me if I know how far that update that I gave him is from the road. noses to the air again and you can see why sometimes tracking him can be quite difficult because you see how many circles we've done all in the similar area we actually haven't gone very far but he's gone round and round and round and round in different circles and it's made it actually a little tough to be able to work out where he's going so if you were on foot here and he and south and north and kind of crisscrossing and that makes it quite difficult to follow now what are you doing now he's going back to another thicket I think there might be another catcher. Yeah. Something is making him very wary of the bushes and the thickets. See his tail? Look at his tail now, it's twitching. I don't see anything though, I don't know what he can be stalking. Unless he's trying to just disturb scrub hairs or, like I say, dikers, but his behavior is so strange. What are you doing? Well, there's not very much that's normal about this cat in terms of what he gets up to. He redefines the leopard manual on a day-to-day -day basis, does Osana. And let's try to keep up with him, though, because it gets very, very, very thicket. Very, very thick bush. Paula, uh, yes, he could be being his silly old self, Osana. He can, it depends on his mood though. It's either this intense curiosity that he is displaying today, or he goes through this crazy playfulness that we saw with, I think it was with James the other day, or he just goes into hunting kind of death cat. Is, it depends on where you catch him and what mood he's in, but there's many faces of Hosanna, and so very interesting to watch. Right, well, we're going to try keep up with him through these thickets. It's going to be quite tricky if he carries on the way he is. While we do that, let's send you back across to Steve and see what he's been up to. I think he's been trying to follow up on some alarm calls.
I'm guessing they don't have us, eh? I'm gonna remember. Now, unfortunately, it sounds like Steve is battling with his comms a little bit, so we'll be back with us for now. And so the curious Wasana that is milling about tail this. What are you up to? I don't know where he's going, but we're not going to be able to follow him, unfortunately, much further. We have to try and get around somehow and then find him again on the other side, which is probably going to be hard, well, easier said than done. I just want to see, there might be a little gap here. There he's slinking again. Why? And I don't know why he's just, he went leopard crawling again across that little gap as though there was something that he was watching. I don't know what he's seen that we haven't. It could be anything, really. I mean, there could be an antelope here that we're just missing that he keeps seeing. Anyway, we're going to try and get ourselves into a better position for the way that he's moving. While we do that, let's send you back across to Steve, who I think has sorted out his comms issues. Yes, well, I can hear you now. Thank you very much, Megan and uh, Tristan. We have with the herd of elephants. Obviously, the picture was going through, but I wasn't hearing anything in my earpiece. We are in Torchwood. Yay! And we've got a small herd of elephant here. Uh, we were following up on some alarm calls just before. We had Kudu going a bit crazy and Waterbuck looking in the wrong direction. Oh, that little youngster is just over there and he's looking very cute. He's looking very cute. He's the one we had framed up. Oh, he's moved just through the gap there. There's the little one. That's the reason we stopped. And we followed up on the alarm calls, but I think because it's so windy, everyone's just a bit jumpy. Even the herd of elephant we saw before, this one was a bit jumpy, but there was no signal there. But Kudu don't lie, so I couldn't. we couldn't quite place it. We moved all over the place looking to see what we could find. But when it's very windy like this, elephant, or not elephant, but animals will quite often mistake um, even small things like Dacre, Steenbok, even Warthog moving through the grass as something predatory. But I've never seen a kudu lie before. And there is mum with her little bit of a snack as she moves along with her little naughty youngster pushing her as she goes. Hello, little one. I just love them. <laughs> What are you picking up on the nose? It's almost like trying to figure out what Hassan is up to. Coming through there. Mum's got a little bit of a forb. A little tasty treat. Youngster's too young to be eating too much. Just drinking milk. She spends her time running around mum. No doubt causing all sorts of mischief. <laughs> and blur a little Dumbo indeed. So nice to see elephants. I could spend my entire drive with a herd of elephants and spend the entire day. And now I'm probably going to move into the little depression there. There's a few more that have disappeared as well. And all the animals seem to be sheltering themselves on sort of the, the east facing slopes. Um, we came around the corner just by Torchwood Lodge and we had zebra and uh, warthog and kuru and yala, or not yala, all of them were just hanging out there just trying to keep away from the wind. The elephants don't like the wind too much so they're down a little bit in the depression. The wind not only is annoying and blows dust but it cools you off too much. Tom, I don't know if elephants are afraid of snakes. Um, it's possible. I really have no idea. I've never seen an elephant react to a snake. Um, there's there's all these stories about how elephants because mice go in their trunks and I think that's all nonsense. But uh, are they afraid of snakes? I think they they would be aware that the snake is there long before before they encounter the snake. They would hear it. They would sense it. Would avoid one. But I've never seen an elephant react to a snake, so I couldn't tell you, Tom. Sorry. S Senzo loves his snakes, don't you, Sens? Yes. We, we had a bird party on our way into Torchwood that was going absolutely crazy. 
and we couldn't find anything and they moved a bit and they moved a bit so what I can assume is that they were probably following a snake because um, a Texan the guide from Juma this morning he he called in on the radio and he was very sort of very uh, sort of loud and hey there is a huge snake <laughs> he was calling it in more out of shock than anything else and he had an enormous black mamba that was moving in and around that area so maybe we found that as well but keeping away from the wind down here we're doing and some animals go underground to keep away from the wind Jamie Patterson is going to be on air again for a second time this afternoon she is up north with her hyena well we thought we'd show you the storm first as we get chatting about hyena because it is taking And enormous, actually. I, I was convinced we were about to get whacked and forced scurrying home. But it looks as though we're actually going to escape. I think we're going to be okay, at least for now, which is great news for Manu and myself because we're, of course, planning to be out here until late this evening, which is why we are here with our hyena friends once again. Oh, thank you very much. That was very considerate of you. Yes, it was. Thank you. It was almost like you knew the camera was on you, which of course you had no idea and you've got no idea what that means. Now I'm not sure if anyone's really explained the way this whole process will, will work over the next few weeks, but essentially between Brent, Scott and myself and Taylor, we all have specific areas of focus. So we will almost inevitably, when you see us live, be focusing on those things. Oh. I can tell you who that is, the same hyena from yesterday, and it is, not yesterday, day before, yesterday? What day is it? What year is it? I have no idea. I've spent so much time with the hyenas, I've lost all need for concept of time. Um, that's Riley, by the way. An immigrant male into North Clan. So that's who we were looking at yesterday and today again. Riley loves the den sites. He's a male that's come in from another clan which means he is right at the bottom of the heap and he often visits and comes and says hello to the cubs and tries to make friends with them and tries to make friends with the females, often gets chased away. I feel sorry for Riley sometimes, he just wants to be part of the scene. Now the reason that we're here and the reason that we rushed away from the lions earlier is simply because that at the moment, the present moment, is, is my job. Um, so we're spending as much time as possible with them, and since I didn't manage to find them where I expected to, which is where the researchers let me know they were hearing vocalizations, we've come back to the den, but this is the best time to be at the den. You can ask Manu if you don't believe me, because Manu's been with me the whole time. And this is around about between now and half past six is when Waffles usually comes charging in. I look around hopefully as I say that and regroups with the rest of her clan before they all dash off. The rest of them that are here are all totally flat. Miss Anon! Miss Anon, who will forever remain anonymous, but presumably a miss. Um, Miss Anon L.C. LCS is Waffles' best friend. I think that's probably something that you read on the Michigan State University blog post. LCS is the lowest ranking female, I mean apart from her daughter Petra. Uh, LCS is the lowest ranking female. She's ancient, she's enormous, and she is Waffles', I wouldn't know if I'd say best friend, but Waffles has often shown a kindness towards her and a gentleness and almost sought out her company. And the answer to whether or not they're still friends is the truth is I've never seen LCS. I look for her every time I see a group of North Clan members and I've never seen her. I suspect, unfortunately, I suspect she might not be with us still, but I don't know. Now, LCS is actually named after the shape of a cut on her left ear. I'll leave you to work out exactly what it is. We stick with the abbreviation, so it's left and then it's the shape of uh, a cut out of her ear in letter C and that is her name. Oh we're up, let's go over there. Let's go see what we've got over here. I think we've got Clever Girl. Oh 
maybe not. That cup looks a bit young for pudding. And you guys are being sleepy. We'll come back to you. So around here, which you can't really see at the moment, there is a massive deep lugger system. And that's basically their hangout spot pretty much every day. On the other side of that lugger system is a second den site. And I'm not sure if they've split into low rankers and high rankers because I've only really, well, we saw sloth bear here, I suppose, which sort of counts against that theory. But I haven't seen soup in ages and I haven't seen waffles in a, in a couple of days as well. The big W, as we've taken to calling her. Morning girl, I think it is clever. It looks like her, she's very faint, very light in color. Eliza, Eliza, Megs, I'm sorry if I've got that wrong. Um, Eliza, I've forgotten how to use my ears. You want to know when last the hyenas killed or ate? <laughs> oh, it's soup. Ha, I just said to you that soup I haven't seen in ages. It's soup. <laughs> that wasn't very... She's a strict mum. Her two offspring, lobster and chow, that's lobster, by the way, tucked in there, and that's chow behind it. Um, she is so unrelenting with them. I don't know if it's because she's a first-time mom and she's not used to those sharp teeth nipping her every now and again while they suckle, which, to be fair, would provoke an uncomfortable reaction. I haven't forgotten the question about when last they ate. I don't know when last they ate. They're so difficult and so busy all the time. Lions can typically sleep up to 20 hours a day. Hyenas are probably on a more human schedule. Unfortunately, though, their schedule is the reverse of mine. And as much time as I spend with them at night, I don't know everything that they get up to. So I suspect the efficiency, their way of hunting, their way of finding food, I suspect they probably hunted last night. They're not fat, though. So whatever it was, it wasn't big. Oh, ciao. How unfortunate, huh? As always, your sister gets the best. So lobster and chow have both been sexed as female. So they are both poop, um, but lobster is dominant. So while we sit and wait for these hyenas to wake up at the perfect time of the den, and if soup's here, means waffles is coming, let's go across to Sydney, who has found something that a hyena would absolutely love to chew on. I have got one of the old evidence here of the Unkuhuma pride. You can see the Unkuhuma pride has been here. And according to my game scout habit, he witnessed this kill. Uh, they came and they caught this buffalo right here. Let me just try to pull this just to feel it. This is, mm, this is very heavy. Oh, the buffaloes, they are very much strong to hold something like this right here on their head. This is very much heavy. Uh, so this is from the buffalo. I can see that these horns can be very much big. So sometimes you find that this is up to one, one and a half meters. Hey, yo, this is looking very, very beautiful. So, but here, if you look here, you can see something is happening here. Let me just check nicely. You can see this is, there's some uh, protuberance here coming out. Quite a lot of these things here. So this is from the, the internet. It's something called the horn borer moth. Uh, it becomes suddenly a butterfly. It has to go through a couple of different stages, instars. When they are doing this is when there is lava inside. It's just that I cannot try and open any of these because if this insect is hiding here, I will be disturbing. So they just come here and they borrow this kind of keratin. This is, this is very much heavy, but this insect can be able to digest something like this, which is made out of a strong keratin. So they come and they use their own droppings and they use the, some of the properties from the horns and then they build these things. They stay inside to protect themselves against the predators and also to protect themselves against high temperatures. It's quite a very much clever insect. It's called the horn borer moth. So now, these kind of buffaloes, they 
they, they eat grass. But if you can check here, we are right in the Donga. This is the dry riverbed. So during the daytime, when the temperature is very much hot, animals such as buffaloes, they prefer to walk in this area like this, and this is where they hide just to control their body temperature a little bit. And then afterwards, they will then wake up and go for drinking purposes, as they are very, very much water dependent. If you can check also now, by this time of the season, the grass is very much dry, so they've got to drink lots. But apart from this skull, we have got some of the bones here as well. Some of these bones, they are eaten, and some of them, they are not eaten yet. So you can see that it is an old bone, but not that very old, because not everything is cleaned up. There's still quite a lot of uh, things showing that uh, this is still very much fresh. Yes, it has been for last year. So now, while I'm still checking for more other small things, let's see, Hosanna is on the move on the other side. Well, with that story about whatever's going on, go out here with us, and don't worry, we've got Hosanna in the vehicle. <laughs> He's sitting nice and comfortable there. Uh, we don't have the glass of signal in certain places here, but uh, we're going to go back over to Tristan, who managed to sort out his sound problems. Indeed, we have, so we've managed to sort out our sound. Fortunately, Hosanna is just starting to move after being posed quite nicely. He's now decided to go into an area which is going to be quite difficult to follow. It looks open, but I'm going to have to somehow make my way through a buffalo thorn thicket to get to where he's going now. So I'm going to try and head in that direction and not get myself slapped by a branch, which is definitely happening, and Wendy is driving me mad. Right, well, we're going to try and catch up and try and get a better view once again, like we had just now. And so while we do that, let's send you back across to Taylor, who's looking at a spotty animal of her own. The giraffe is exactly what we have. Look at that, it's beautiful. Now, I must tell you ah, that this giraffe was actually checking Archie out. <laughs> It was quite funny. There were loads of vehicles on the road watching this giraffe, and she was just walking away, and she was staring straight at us, not at me. Archie was standing out, not outside the car, but he kind of, he sticks out of the car. Archie is quite a tall human being, and I am a frozen human being at the moment. It's pretty ridiculous. It probably seems like I'm in, it should be snowing somewhere, but it is really, really chilly. I'm sure Jamie looks similar. Does she? Does she also have a big jacket on? I know she's got a big khaki jacket like this too. So, yes, it's cold all of a sudden. I'm very much looking forward to having a hot shower and getting into my pajamas and my fluffy slippers. Might even have to wear the fluffy slippers out on Game Drive at some point. Yes, Jamie was also bundled up. Yeah, it's cold. You could only see Archie now too. He's got all sorts of gear on too. He kind of looks like a snowman, just like me. But we haven't had much luck. I tried to find some more lions. Don't know where the black rhino are. They're being quite sneaky, but at least we have found a few giraffe. They're, actually, it's quite a big group of giraffe, but the rest is moving off now. And we've just got that one giraffe in the distance that's now t turned her bottom towards us. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you, giraffe. It's a very pretty setting, though, this evening. Very dramatic with all the clouds. I said, view never gets old. And Sadly, there are not that many places in South Africa where you have a beautiful view and can go on safari. There, there are a couple. There definitely are a couple. I don't find the Sabi land particularly this is quite nice. Big open plains, lots of rocky outcrops, I've told you. Other large river systems. How do I keep turning my volume up so much? Sorry, talking to myself here. Because I keep turning the volume up on the radio unintentionally and then it blares. Um, Aaron, no, I have not found any more jackal dens. Um, I'm trying to think when jackal season starts. It's not like the end of July, August. No, it's later than that. 
is it September, October, somewhere around there. I can't really remember. Maybe even later than that. But no, I haven't. And I have checked up and down for uh, the two, not the the, fan, the Furtastic Four. That's what they were called, the Furtastic Four. But um, I have not seen the Furtastic Four whatsoever. I'm sure that they've dispersed now. That you know, they're already quite old when we were watching them. They're you know spending a bit more time on their own, foraging for themselves. So I, you know, I wouldn't imagine. I never thought I'd ever going to see them again. I just have to go back and reminisce at all my pictures and videos and all the wonderful live segments we've done with them because we really were were quite spoiled in fact i'm just looking around to see if maybe a black rhino is going to walk out the bushes because we are in black rhino country at the moment also leopard country potentially but i've not not seen any anyways somebody who is on the move and keeps you entertained all the time well tristan does that too but hosanna does it better Well, we are with Hosanna, and we figured out what his strategy is at the moment and why he's walking up to bushes the way he is. It's exactly what I thought. Because he's trying to spook scrub hairs, so he just spooked one now. Unfortunately, he was a bit slow on the uptake and didn't get it right, but that's what he's busy doing. So he's walking from bush to bush, trying to come out, and then he's able to go and hunt them. But isn't that light just absolutely beautiful? The problem is, is that he's marching his way northwards steadily now. So he really is getting further and further away from here. And I'm just hoping that he's not going to go towards Buffalo's Hook. Because if he goes towards Buffalo's Hook, there's a dam just north of us that he could potentially spend quite a bit of time at. And it'll be, make it quite tough for us. But uh, turning back around now, which is good. So he hopefully continues the route that he's walking now. That'll hopefully take him back into our area but lots of yawning lots of sniffing about oh bless you Hosanna so he seems to be a busy busy cat David I think he's going to come say hello to you at this rate nope toilet time let's see if he scrapes his back legs or if he's gonna go do a number two I think it might be a number two this one no nothing at all Hosanna what are you up to now oh, off he goes again Right, let's turn around and try and get back towards where he's going. He's going to, down into the drainage, which is never very easy to follow. So while I try and see if I can actually stick with him here, because it's not going to be very easy at all, I'm going to send you back all the way to the Masamara and Jamie with, well, her favorite animals, the North Clan. Everybody's waking up now. SEO's made an appearance with his torn left ear. Oh, and Sloth Bear is presenting himself. Like me, like me, please like me. To a higher ranked female, to Soup and her two daughters. Oh no! Did she ignore you completely? Well, that's better than being bitten on the bottom, let me tell you. Now he's coming to investigate behind me. I've also got him Zimu, currently occupied with. Uh, get down! I thought we were past this. Down. Get down. Oi. Get down. Yeah. Naughty. Naughty. Well, the thing about these hyena cubs is that they are, as you know, regularly researched, which means that they have contact with people almost every single day for the last 10 years. That means that the hyena cubs have absolutely no fear of us or the vehicle. But what's fascinating is that once their curiosity plays out, Paisley, I can feel you tugging the cover behind me. Once their curiosity sort of plays out and they learn what we mean and all about us, they, they completely lose it. And they, you will never find, I've not had one adult of North Clan apart from Fergus who doesn't... Oh, careful, careful. Yes, yeah, soupy gentle. She's not inherited her mother's, her grandmother's lovely attitude. She's very pretty. Anyway, I've never had an adult come up and approach me, and in fact, most of the adults of North Clan are quite wary. Ooh, Stacy, I have learned so much about hyenas in the past four months. I difficult to choose the most interesting one. I will tell you that they are the most exhilarating animal to follow at night. I never thought I'd say that, but they really are. You feel like you're running with the clan. 
uh, we've had a few experiences where one minute we've been sitting at the den and the next we just go. And we don't go for a kilometer. We go for five kilometers. I mean, it's absolutely terrifying. You're driving on the pure faith, hoping you don't hit a hole, doing your best not to hit a hole in the ground. And they run on either side of you. What is that? And where did you get it from? It doesn't look like it came from us. Um, Paisley. That, that is the most exhilarating thing I've ever seen. I can tell you that during their attacks, during a clan war, without giving too much away, they go completely silent when they, act when they do charge in. The fact that the males form such an important part, the, the natal males form such an important part, to the point that they could actually potentially lead a clan, has come as a revelation to me. I didn't realize that. Although most of them in this area, but in particular, will disperse. And their personalities. I've always believed that hyenas have individual personalities, but they really, really do. Now, I've spent, to recognize all of them, I've actually spent hours staring at their photographs and then going through footage and testing myself and then coming back and doing it again. And I still don't, the cubs with their fresh, fluffy coat of fur. No, don't do that. Do you know how many of our shots are occupied with hyenas cleaning themselves? We fi Trying to find footage of hyenas not doing that is almost impossible. Here's something interesting. Lobster and chow are lying up against soup, and you can immediately see which one is dominant and which one is not. The, the cub that is tucked up a long soup, so that one over there, that's the more dominant one. That's Lobster, who decided right at that moment to disengage herself. And with her bottom exposed to the elements, so to speak, is Chow. They're a bit big for that to really make sense, but imagine that they were smaller, and you could see how the hyena in Lobster's position, who's currently very restless, would have the best spot tucked up against Mum and how Chow would be the more exposed one. Hi, girl. They're pretty things. I know that everybody, not everybody, most people don't see the fascination in, hello, pudding, pudding. What do you think you're doing? Don't, you don't even have your feet up against my thing. You've got your wrists on it, honestly. Listen, if you pick Graham's stickers off the side of his car, he's going to be very... <laughs> Isn't it ridiculous? So in terms of letting them touch the car, I do let them get away with more than I would most other hyenas because this is what they've been taught to do and I've seen no negative effects. And also, if I spent my entire time trying to keep them off the car, I, I don't even know. I would, I, that's all I would be doing. They lose interest pretty quickly. It wasn't pudding, it was paisley. Of course it was paisley. Go, go, go bother lobster and chow. Okay, our spotted bottoms are getting reacquainted. Let's go and rejoin Steve with something stripey instead. Yes, well thank you Jamie. Fantastic that we're getting regular viewing of hyena again. And here we have found two zebra that are in the burnt area of the fire break. Because it's in my experience that zebra absolutely love to come into these burnt patches because grass is actually stimulated by fire. <clears throat> How beautiful is he? The only reason I can tell it's a he at the moment was because when we arrived he had, um, well, let me just say, he was revealing himself. A little bit jumpy in the wind. There are lions prowling around and zebras are one of the prey, preferred prey species. So you see how they do it. They stand with their back to the wind so that they can see anything that might try to sneak up on them in the front. So you see that, how you'd think there's nothing to feed on here in a burnt area, but yet his face has gone down in search of something. Is it maybe the ash that they're after? Beautiful. 
constantly moving those ears. Nice shot sends. So it's a question that I've been asked many times before is how do you in good condition? You can't really look at the hind quarters like you do in most animals. And it's all got to do with the mane. The mane of hair on the back of the neck, if that is standing up straight and firm like that, well, that is in good condition. As soon as they start losing condition, that starts getting a little bit raggedy and a bit sort of falling on itself, should I say. And there we go. He's just decided to put himself in some better lighting for you. Rachel, you would be very hard-pressed trying to get close enough to a wild zebra to touch it, and they most certainly do bite. If you did manage to sneak up behind one, it would probably kick you first. A very powerful foot. Um, the potential to break the jaw of a lion, even the shoulder. I've seen a lion with a broken shoulder from the kick of a zebra. And the famous jock of the bush felt it was a Staffordshire terrier that was in and around these wild lands with a very famous explorer, Percy Fitzpatrick, and his dog in the movie anyway, I think in the book. I don't think I ever read the book, but in the movie. If you've never seen it, ladies and gentlemen, you should do I actually went out with a girl who was related to Percy Fitzpatrick. Had some very nice leather-bound copies on her shelf. The originals. And anyway, Jock of the Bush felt the dog got kicked by a zebra in the movie and it looked quite painful. Ramping bull elephant, you want to know about a zebra's brain size and if it's the same as a horse? Well, I'd assume it. Oh, he's having a scratch. He's found a spot where he can scratch. Oh, he's going to get another spot of him there. There we go. The barely scratches. Oh, there we go. When you don't have fingers, ladies and gentlemen. That is how a zebra gets to those itchy bits. One leg over. Okay, that's enough. I have no idea. I would assume um, that the the brain would be a very similar size to that of a horse. You've got a bit of a funny ear, fellow, don't you? Oh, that's what he's going to do. He's going to turn around and show a look that zebras, zebras exhibit when they find a scratching post. Okay, not it's not the best scratching post. He's got a few scars on him. I think this is a, a male that's been through a few battles, a few bite marks, one on the ear, one behind the neck. But I would assume their brains are similar to that of horses, but I, I would have no idea. I'd say the brain size would maybe be a sort of equivalent to the size of the body, and horses are, well, the way that they are bred now, they're a bit bigger than zebra. But um, I don't know. I really wouldn't be able to answer that for you, but I would just assume that they're very similar to body size. And clever animals, they are. Beautiful. I just love zebra in this light. Well, being on bushwalk as well in this light is also quite spectacular. And it's good. I have got one of the very interesting story to share with you this afternoon. When looking at this side, I can see there's quite a lot of evidence showing that the elephant has been here. They broke quite a lot of trees. In my tribe, this is what happens. What I'm seeing here now, the broken trees, this has got something to do with the marriage in my tribe. When the two couples are about to get married, a night before they get married, the elders must have to take them through a process of giving them an advice when it comes to how it works by the marriage. So these uh, women, they get told that a vendor man is like an elephant. The elephants, they don't feed on one tree. For a diet, they have got to concentrate on completely different trees. You must understand that. Now, what I have seen these days is that the girls of today, when they are told that, they change and say, okay, if my husband is going to be like an elephant feeding on different trees, like a tree, and I will allow these elephants to come, different elephants to come and feed on me. So, but that is even working today. We still even got a saying which says an elephant 
is an, a, a vendor man is like an elephant. He doesn't feed on one tree. In vendor is like Muna Lindo Hali Muri Muti. A man is an elephant. Muna Lindo Hali Muri Muti. He doesn't feed on one specific tree. So let's see what we can find much more this side. So what I've got now here is this very lovely dry tree. And I can see that this tree, just check here, Craig, you see this tree? This is the lead wood. When I'm looking at, uh, at this wood, I can see this is the lead wood. The lead wood is not just a tree. This tree is one of the very much important trees and it's medicinal used. But you can also use it together with, with some other trees. I'm going to give you another story. Having problems with fertility, if the fertility is lost to the woman, this is what we do. We go and take a buck, we debuck the marula tree, and we come to the lead wood. And by the lead wood, we must consider the following. We come and take the root, which is facing east. So east of where I'm standing now, it will be this side. We're going to have to come and follow the route which is facing east, and that route must be walking and must be passing by a pathway where the people are walking on top. So it means the route which is facing east and the people are passing on top is the route that we must take, and we mix it, we infuse it, and we give it to that woman. After drinking that water, I can promise you the woman is going to restore fertility, and that works. I have seen it happening, and it is still happening today. In Venda, quite a lot of trees there has a clinical test and they are very much successful still waiting for some other trees uh, to be evaluated and most of these trees are happening here in juma game reserve so i still have got a lot to share with you about trees Anna marie my favorite tree at this stage it is called the weeping boa beam is called the Scotia brush petala. That is the scientific name. So it's one of the very lovely tree. It's just that here where I am, I've been looking and I can't see it, but I have seen it here. And I will also talk about it when I see it and why I love that tree the most, because it has got a story also involving myself at young age. Nothing is happening here. It looks very much quiet now. Maybe only the nocturnal insects are going to start to wake up now. But some of them do both nocturnal and diurnal life, like the like our ants. They don't sleep. So ants, we're still going to see them at night. So I'm just trying to see if I'm going to find anything new here where I am. Even the tracks are very much difficult here where I am. But I know here where the elephants are breaking the trees and everything, it suddenly becomes the home of too many animals, including insects and some of the small mammals, they hide in there. Rats, they also hide in there. So it's just that those animals can be very much fast. So this is from the elephant and uh, here I can see it's not an old elephant if you look at this the size of this dropping you can see that it was not a very big elephant so maybe it's an elephant which is about yeah two three years old considering the size I can take a guess at approximately two three years also when looking at what this elephant is eating there is no hard materials here. So now, while I'm going to look for these other things, let's see what Steve is having on the other side. Yeah, well, we just had some Franklins having a boxing match. There they are. Koki Franklins, two males, having a proper fight. This is their patch. <laughs> 
Oh, we just missed it. Maybe they're going to have another go. There he goes, disappearing. Maybe we just go back a bit. They didn't even care. We were driving right past, and they're having a proper fight. I've never seen them fighting before. Access to females, perhaps, or access to these feeding grounds. Where have they gone? They're in there somewhere. No, the action was over as quickly as it started. That was very cool though. We saw them having a proper little on the back foot. <laughs> Sounds like they're fighting, they're fighting. I didn't know what he was talking about. We had just seen a squirrel. So, anyway, that was fun. No doubt the one overstepped his mark and he's been put in his place. And uh, he will walk off and they'll just let it go. Like ducks and geese, they might interfere with each other for a moment and then they, they flap their wings and they let it go. We, on the other hand, we'll have an argument with someone and we'll let it, let it grow and boil up inside of us for months and weeks and years. Some people have got vendettas with other people for years and how unnecessary is that? Okay, I win the fight, you win the fight. Let it go, in the moment, done and dusted. Okay, well we're gonna continue on the sunset. And in the meantime, let's go to Tristan, see if he can find Hosanna. Well, no, so Hosanna has given us the slip. How I am absolutely baffled. We had him standing on a bank and then we got round through a bush and as we got to the other side he was just managed, magically gone and there wasn't exactly thick on either side of where he was standing but I have no idea where he's gone from there so I'm just trying to do loops around but it's getting more and more likely that I'm not going to find him again because the time is now getting quite long since I last saw him and the way that he's been moving it's very difficult to know which way he actually went. We've done loops around, and now I'm just trying to get bigger and bigger with our loops in case he's gone a different direction. It's just, I don't see any sign of him at all. There's no alarm calls, there's no birds making a noise, so I'm not sure which way he went. Well, Rosin leopards can walk very far. If you take Hukumuri for uh, example, over well, probably close to about 200 kilometers going from where he was born to where he is now as a dominant individual but if you're talking about in a single night well it's very dependent it depends on a lot of things are they on a territorial patrol are they hunting are they you know being chased by other leopards but some leopards will do 20 30 kilometers in a night if they're being forced to maybe even more so they can move quite a long way should they want to or should they be persuaded to by another? Hosanna, where did you go? I'm baffled. I honestly have no idea how he's managed to disappear as quickly as he did. And he's not exactly been moving fast the whole afternoon. He's just been ambling along the whole time. And so we should have picked him up very, very quickly from where he once was. And I don't see him at all. I'm perplexed. It's not an ideal situation to be in. I don't like being perplexed when it comes to leopards and I suppose in this kind of a ter terrain it's happening. not normally that kind. He's not normally sneaky and not... Okay, I can hear some birds alarm calling right here. So I wonder if he isn't somewhere in this vicinity. There were some Franklins, few birds going crazy so I'm just gonna get back onto this little two track that takes me around to the old hyena den see if he hasn't gone to that termite mound and while I do that it sends you back across to Taylor McCurdy who's admiring the view in the Masai Mara and I believe it's a beautiful sunset well first we're looking at an animal that sees a view than more of the other animals but look at them they even are cowering down towards the this afternoon it's crazy how the weather just changes so dramatically and you'll see that all oh, that's all rain in the distance all those dark patches 
It's on bare grain. I think we're lucky. We've missed completely blown it away. There's some of the Angama guides on their way home, climbing the escarpment, which we will be doing shortly too. It is so beautiful up here. Way to turn, so <laughs> Archie's just like, hey, this girl's crazy. But anyways, um, <laughs> it is very windy out here today, and it's so cold. I can't, I can't tell you how cold it is. We have had some cooler evenings. Um, luckily our tents are nice and warm. That's really, really quite good. Tonight's a good evening for soup, don't you think? And I don't mean to eat meaning eat mean eating the hyena. I'm talking about actual soup and homemade bread. So let's hope that's on the cards. Fingers crossed. Anyways, it seems as though we're having some technical difficulties. So Archie and I are going to head on home, and we'll see you next time. I am trying to check what I'm going to find here. I just saw a squirrel and just got disappeared just now. And some of those animals, such as the squirrels, they are very much important animals. We also check them a lot. When the squirrel is feeding, this is what you must do. You must check. They don't just feed. They first taste the food eat. If the food is poisonous, they leave it. But if by any mistake they ingest poison, this is what they are going to do. They will climb down very quickly and come and get the soil. And they will eat the soil. And after eating that soil, they are going to make sure that the digestive system is going to work very slowly so that it does not absorb the poison. And that is how they manage to get rid of the poisons. Now, the hairs for the squirrels, we use them. The squirrels' hairs, you can use them as an antibiotic, but also for in case if you ingest poisonous or toxic stuff by a mistake, what you must do is you must have to be able to uh, eat those hairs and get them to the stomach so that they can assist you when it comes to fighting against the toxic the toxic substance you have eaten. It works very well and it does even um, make sure that the poison is out. So the squirrels, why they've got to come down and eat this soil is because squirrels, it's a pity that they, uh, their digestive system cannot be able to throw up. They only take in, they can't take back. That's why they've got a mechanism to fight against the toxic substances. So now, let's see, maybe we're gonna find something. It's just that that squirrel just decided to run away. We should have seen it. It was gonna be very much interesting to see it. So now I will be going up much more to the quarantine and see if we can find something. Let's go to Jenny. JB with the hyena is a fairly common thing you're going to be hearing over the course of the next few weeks. So, Sawa came in. Actually, let me just show you this. So we were there. Sawa came in. I just had a few things to do, unfortunately. So we got those finished up. Sawa is over there. Sawa, S-A-U-E-R, mother of the youngest North Clan, who of course is called Sloth Bear. He has siblings named Gummy Bear, Teddy Bear, Corduroy Bear, Paddington Bear, Arctodus, and Black Bear, in case you were wondering. You probably weren't, but there you go. Now you have another piece of information. Oh, let's go quickly this side. Sorry, little sloth bear. You are cute, but we're busy this side now. Someone's got a, a bone of some description. Paula, I do, I do, I do have a favorite hyena. I'll show you her now. I, okay, so I'm really fond of waffles, but I think that's just because I see her all the time. She's a matriarch and she's so easily identifiable. And I just like her. Soup and I, well, Soup's very beautiful. Um, she doesn't have the same gentle side that her mother does. But I'm going to, is Soup's over here ignoring me completely? She doesn't care what opinion I have of her. As I said, they've got personalities. You're all going to scoff at me, or most of you are going to But you haven't spent, on average, 10 hours a day with them for four months. I'll come, sh oh, let me show you my favorite hyena, because she's here. She's got so big, sometimes I don't recognize her anymore. It makes me quite sad. 
Hi guys. Uh, one thing I will say is that the Mara Conservancy, so where we are, we're in the Mara Triangle run by the Mara Conservancy, have been unbelievably kind in allowing us to off-road for hyenas, which is something that not is not generally allowed. Hi. Here she is. Here's my favorite hyena. Hey, Pezel, what are you doing? Shame, whenever something comes around, she never gets a piece of it because she's low-ranked. So along with her cousins, um, SEO and BFG, she she never really gets much, but she doesn't stop her from being the cheekiest out of all of them. Someone's coming, but we'll get she'll come to us in a moment. So all these cubs are getting so big now, taking a lot of time away from the den site. What you got there? Is that nice? That is a very old bone. That does not look enjoyable at all. I think with with big cats they're easy to love. They're very good looking. They move beautifully, they're graceful, they're strong, they they they're easy for people to really form a connection to. But hyenas face exactly the same challenges that they do, arguably even more so, although they are very adaptable. But essentially they come into contact with human beings more often than the big cats do because they're so curious and they're so adaptable. But people tend to ignore their plight. They're not endangered at the moment, fortunately. But it is something that we need to we need to try and work on, is building people's connection with this intelligent creature. We don't really have much of a sunset to write home about by Mara Sanders, and perhaps we can go across to Juma and see if Well, it would not be a day without a sunset. I don't think there's ever been a day recorded in history without a sunrise or sunset. And we here at Safari Live love to stop and spend a moment to watch the sun setting in the west. A dawn for some and an evening for others. A good time to reflect on one's day, as always. So I'm just going to hold off speaking for a moment and let you all just enjoy the beauty that is. Wowzers and beautifuls and wonderfuls indeed, folks. The sun is setting there behind the Drakensberg Mountain. The escarpment to our west it creates the high felt. And it's amazing how quickly it sinks behind there. And always special to spend these moments. Thank you for joining us with it. If we can just remember one moment in every day just to, to be present, that's a start. Stop thinking about all the worries of the world just for a moment. What a time to be alive indeed makes. Indeed, it's very warm wind. I don't even know if I'm going to be putting on a jacket this evening. But with this warm wind coming from the west, that's come from inland, so basically from where the sun is set, so that's why it's so warm. <coughs> Excuse me. And invariably this wind pushes sort of a front out to sea on the east coast, and then that sucks in a cold front. So I'm guessing tonight, tomorrow, potentially is going to start getting a little bit overcast, and then we're going to get a cold front sucking back in, and the weekend is going to be pretty chilly. That's just my thoughts. Let's see how that pans out. Oh, deep breath in and out. How fantastic was that? Well, thank you, Senzo, for some marvelous shots. Hope everyone back home is doing wonderfully well. Not much to be said about it. Just it's uh, 
setting and we get the, the privilege to see it. reports of a lioness that was in the west so we moved over this way slowly to see if we could find her but the person who saw her lost her and it's a very good chance she crossed north into Buffel's Hook so we're gonna keep scratching around see if we can get anything and if not well, who knows well anyway let's go to Tristan see what he thought about that Well, I'm just sitting very quietly listening out in case there's some alarm calls from where Hosanna potentially could have been. That's where we lost him. He's pretty much in that thicket over there. We can't seem to find any sign of him. Can't find tracks, can't find any thermal image using the flare. And it's just, I don't know, blew wings and flew away because he's not where we last saw him. And we literally were not even, I would say, a minute to get around that bush. And he was gone. And so I don't know where he's gone and what he's gotten up to. So we thought we'd come to Gallagher Pan and just have a little look around and just see if there is any sign of him coming for water. It's obviously a good place for him to come and drink. It's that time of the day when a leopard would kind of come into this area and drink. So you can see the pan is right there. So I thought it would be a good idea just to sit here for a little bit. It's also a great time of the day to listen for any vocalizing of maybe Tingano or any lions that could potentially be around. And so we're just going to sit in and just be patient and, and try and figure out what's going on. It's a beautiful evening. The wind has settled quite nicely. Now there's still a little bit of a breeze, but it's not as much as what, is it, what it was earlier in the day. And it's perfect temperature to be out on a safari. It's not too cold, it's not too hot. It really is a beautiful day and so where that light patch is in the center of screen next to the dead tree that's where we lost him around there so it's not far i mean it's probably 200 meters from the pan 300 meters that he has to walk and to get into this area okay well while we sit and just listen out a little bit longer see if he does arrive at the pan let's send you let's not send you anywhere because we're going to send it straight to me because megs is using the wrong radio so we'll wait for megs to get the right radio and then we'll send you across to sydney who i'm sure is on his way home to finish up his bushwalk I am right here next to the dam. I was hoping to find something interesting, but I can see that nobody is here. There was only few birds. They just got away just now. They were having just a last drink. You know, these birds, they feed on quite a lot of seeds and this. And these kind of seeds, they need them to come and drink because they are very much hard. They are not moisturized. So I just saw some doves here. And these kind of birds, the doves, how they drink is very much interesting. Some other birds, they drink like this. They collect water and they must have to face up and hold back. But when it comes to these dove, how they drink, they can be able to drink and swallow when they are facing down. Other birds, they cannot do it while facing down. So the doves are very much... And now this is becoming... Uh, we are heading towards the end of my walk now and it's becoming interesting. The sun is going down. It's a pity that I am leaving, but we will talk again tomorrow. I will be with you tomorrow again. So let's see, maybe I will find something just before I get disappeared. I can see now it's not clear, clear anymore. It's very much difficult to see even some of the birds up in this tree. I was trying, I saw some little bit of movement. I thought it was an owl, but I can see that it's not. It is the hornbill, maybe the hornbill going back right somewhere up there by those branches. I just saw there's something right there. So that is the yellow build or the red build hornbill. I can't even see what exactly this species is so it seems like this bird is heading to somewhere now where it's hiding so go to jenny he's got hyena guess who decided to show up to the party and throw his weight around that is ferg son of waffles and therefore the third highest ranked hyena in north clan after his brother hershey and the only reason hershey's higher ranked than he is is because hershey's younger so there you go that is remember if we talk about themes ferguson farms 
Now this clan, for newer viewers, is led by a matriarch called Waffles, so female dominated. And this is her son, Fergus, who has inherited her status and after bullying everyone, decided he wanted to lie down with Sour, despite sending her running. Now Soup has gone and moved across this big lugger. Now I know if Ferg is here and Soup is here, it means Hershey and Waffles are here somewhere as well and they're hungry. Soup is really looking very hungry and I think what I said about them eating yesterday might or last night might actually have been a mistake. They're gonna go hunting tonight. I'm almost certain of it. She does have a very upright posture, old Soup. She's got a very noble, regal look. And we're going to sleep. Cool. And I've lost every cub. Fergus has arrived, and now Ferg actually has a reputation of being very sweet and gentle with cubs, but I don't know, they all seem to have vanished. Absolutely, Cantrell. Yes, 100% of the Mara hyenas are fluffier than the Juma hyenas. Unequivocally, yes. They're also much smaller. Their clans are larger, they are smaller, their coats are fluffier, and that's because on average it is actually colder here than it is on Juma. Now at the moment Juma is ice freezing cold in the mornings, um, but we are in the Mara, although we are nearer the equator, we are at a very high altitude, so we're nearly 2,000 meters above sea level. As a consequence, it's very cold here, and you'll find most of the animals are a little bit fluffier than they would be in South Africa. Okay, we have got a hyena. Ask me no further questions and I shall tell you no lies. I don't know who that is. I can't see through the mud. That shoulder should be quite distinctive and I think it's one of the Michael Jackson songs. But we'll find out now when we see who goes to her. So there's Billie Jean and Smooth Criminal and they are named obviously their sisters as all mothers have themes. And I think this is Billy. Have a look at me, you can see scars on her back. Billy is low ranked. Oh. See, it could be criminal, I just can't see through that fur. They both, another surprising thing I've learned about hyenas, and I promise you this is true, um, you can actually see which ones are related to each other. You can see similarities in spots. Some hyenas have very bold, very clear spots. Some don't have very bold and very clear spots. Some are a reddish color. Some are a beige color. I know it sounds absurd, but I can really clearly see that Paisley is related to her mother and to her two cousins. Well, we've spoken about that with leopards before. Is it really that unbelievable that you can see it in hyenas too? Now, Yvette, if we have a look at the cubs, you can see a nice comparison between a... Mm, how old is that cub? About a year old cub and a six month old cub, sloth bear and whoever on earth that is, I have no idea. And you want to know how long they keep that fluffy coat for. For the next, I would say the next six months to a year. So once they reach two years old, their fur starts to become this of a, an adult hyena but it's not this long stringy fluffy I don't even know how you'd describe it I mean their coats really are ridiculous at this age so a sloth bear is nice and easy you can clearly see it's him but the individual at the back its spots are almost obscured by the fluffiness of its coat they become really difficult especially for me where I some of the photographs that I have which I'm deeply grateful for are of them when they were still very small. Where did the rest of those cubs go? Oh, they're hiding. Okay, now, Fergus, go and fetch your mother. I wonder how our cameraman on Juma feels that he has a hyena that shares, well, admittedly, uh, our cameraman on Juma's full name is not Ferguson Farms, as far as I know. 
But I wonder how he feels sharing a name with a spotted hyena in, in the Mara. That is Billy. Yeah, Sometimes it helps just to have both sides. Aw, oh, Megs tells me that Ferg isn't working today so she can't check and see how he feels about it. I'm sure deeply, deeply honoured, of course. Everyone wants to be named after a hyena. Especially one called, I don't know, Soup, or LCS, or Waffles. For our newer viewers, I didn't name them, by the way. They are names given by the Michigan State University Mara Hyena Project, and they are the reason that we have access to all of this information, which is incredible. And so we sit and so we wait for the big W to show her face. Let's go and see what Steve is looking for out in South Africa. Thanks, Jamie. I think you absolutely love those names, though. I can't wrap my head around all of them. The other day we were watching a few videos for the up-and-coming show, and I think you mentioned the word Ferg, and <laughs> we all laughed quite loudly. <laughs> I don't know if Ferg was paying attention, but we all laughed very loudly. It was funny. It was very funny. I still haven't got my head around that whole naming thing and how it'll work. But I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm glad you, Jamie's got her head wrapped around it. Waffles. <laughs> Every time we hear that name, I just laugh. And soup and clam chowder. It's really hilarious. Anyway, so he has a very prominent game path. All the way up to the northwest, Sydney's Dam. Always good to check these paths. There's no sign of that, that lion. It's a lioness, by the way. And uh, I never got a look at her. Uh, it was a landowner who saw her, so I didn't see her. But a lioness on her own normally means potentially a denning lion, a female with cubs somewhere. But uh, we don't know who she is. I don't know who she is. Maybe Telemati Pride? Has it a guess? position or the area she's been seen in. have to ask Tristan a little bit later what he thinks who she might be. But I do miss seeing lions on the property. Watching them from the it was very, very cool. Hello Peter Viper. Well in nature, male birds most certainly in the, the most of them, most species, the males are more flamboyant than the females. There's a number, a couple of species out there that the females are a little bit more flamboyant, but not too many. But when it comes to the animal kingdom, the mammal kingdom, I don't know, I wouldn't say so. Uh, but definitely with birds, definitely with birds. If you do yourself a favor and go and look up some paradise, birds of paradise from Madagascar, unbelievable what devices these birds have come up with with regards to mating and impressing the very unimpressed female incredible the the feathers the patternings the shapes the dances these guys do it is unbelievable david attenborough did something a life of birds series fantastic you have a look at that you see what those birds get up to i find it quite quite mind-blowing what evolution can do and what very picky females lead the males to to devise there's just slight differences when you see these birds and you think okay well they all look identical we could measure them we could weigh them with the feathers whatever it might be um, scientists have gone and watched these dances and often it's an elect display where a number of males come together and they display for watching females and you will see the males to you to us look identical but time and time again the one male will get picked off go to the side the female will will mate and then he'll come back into the ring again and do his thing and the same another female another female the same individual gets selected again and again but to us to our mind we don't see we don't see the differences so I always thoroughly enjoy the bird kingdom well talking about waffles and all sorts of tasty morsels <laughs> I believe uh, Jamie is back up there with her hyena and let's go see who exactly she's looking at this isn't waffles this is paisley and this is a surprise I've been keeping under my sleeve I haven't perfected it hey hey what is that that doesn't look good 
Paisley. <laughs> That's a piece of the gaffer tape we wrapped around it. That is the cub cam and the color balance obviously wasn't right because Manu is showing it to you on my monitor. The first time we used cub cam, Paisley, now you've left it over the cover. The least you could have done was taken it off. It's a little camera that we've got welded. We've got welded bars up against the front of the bull bar. And when they come up to investigate, that's what they go and sniff, but they can't actually get the camera itself. Well, that's what I thought the first time. And then they ate the cable, and apparently it was a really expensive camera and difficult to fix. But VM fixed it, so we're all good, except now we have a piece of loose gaffer tape over it. Paisley, what am I going to do with you? So, unfortunately, we don't have infrared lights with, well, we do, we have, we have an ME20 um, with infrared lights, a camera for filming at night, but we don't have an extra set of infrared lights so that we can continue with this camera. So once it starts to get a little bit dark, we're going to struggle to be able to show you these things. I can just hear Paisley hitting her head on my car. <laughs> it's always her. Hey, Sloth Ben, you're so well behaved. You are so well behaved. Shaggy Dog! Hyena males have their own hierarchy. Hyena males born into the clan inherit their mother's hierarchy. So wherever she sits, like for example, for Sloth Bear, his mother's a mid high ranker, which makes him a mid high ranker obviously higher ranked than the rest of his siblings because he's the youngest once hyenas reach around two or three years of age they generally disperse away from the clan and they move to a new clan at which point no matter what their previous status they are sent right to the bottom of the hierarchy so they go right to the bottom look there's some never never give an absolute rule with hyenas but generally speaking the newest arrival in a group of immigrant males will be the lowest ranker no I've got big friendly giants behind me trying to no, I've been I've been wrapping the covers all the way up but they haven't done this in so long that I really thought we were past the stage. Hey, uh, uh, uh. no, that I can't allow. I found that the simplest way is starting the vehicle, but they'd sometimes. Sometimes I just have to move a bit. There we go. Very gently, very slowly, stops the nonsense. And don't worry, there's no risk of running over a hyena cub. They are very clued up. I'll just move slowly. Okay. This has been life for Manu and myself for a long time now. Generally going, no, stop it, no, no. Start the car, move the car. Start the car, move the car. Paisley went through a stage, which fortunately she's grown out of, of climbing onto the bull bar in front and resting her paws there. And then I'd move the car and she'd just walk on her hind legs. But as I said, not one North Clan member, as an adult, demonstrates that same behavior. What's that? It's a Thompson. It's a Thompson's gazelle, yes. Go on, fetch it. They'll start hunting at a roundabout, or, or hunting is a strong word. They'll start participating of a hunt at around eight months old. They become curious, they follow the adults, um, they, I've seen them a few times at hunt sort of situations. They don't actually have much to contribute. The reason being that their jaws, their bone crushing jaws that hyenas are famous for, do not fully develop until they are two years old, or at least the muscles do not. So they've got all the instincts. Watching a group of Thompson's gazelle, for example, but no real ability. Oh, she's pregnant. That Tommy is massive, absolutely enormous. We've started to see the first few baby Thompsons as well, which is my favorite time of year. Okay, North Clan, where are you leading us to next now that you've pulled a strip of tape in front of my camera? Hmm? 
We're going to sit and wait for the arrival of the queen and a battle cry or silent battle cry to go out that it's time to hunt. Let's go and join Tristan and Juma where it's getting dark for him as well. It is indeed, uh, Jamie. It is getting very dark and I must admit, Jamie has probably one of the better jobs in the world, sitting with that den and that hyena clan. They are amazing and very fascinating to see the social interactions of that particular clan and the fact that Jamie's managed to get to know them so well is a testament to her studious nature and how good she is actually at identifying hyenas. It's pretty uncanny really. I spent some time there myself and there is a lot of hyenas in the Mara and Jamie tends to get it right quite often so pretty good work from Jamie. Now I heard her talking about the cub cam as well. Now you all need to ask Jamie about her story with the cub cam because she's got a highly entertaining one that happened to her with cub cam uh, she'll know exactly what I'm talking about and she'll probably be giggling at the thought of actually having to explain what happened I don't know if she will explain what happened but it is quite funny so if you all want a, a good story then that is a story you need to ask Jamie Patterson in fact maybe next time we see her live we should all ask her what happened on the, cum ca the cub cam La, 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 la. It's too many C's in one. Cub Cam. A few we it was a few weeks ago, it was just before I left the Mara, um, or it was just after I left the Mara, I can't remember. It was somewhere around there. But she should be laughing about it. Megan, did you tell her? I'm waiting for Megan to tell me what Jamie says. It's a bit of a delay to the Mara. She says, gee, thanks, Tristan. Well, Jamie, I mean, I haven't given anything away. You're welcome to make any story you really like, but the truthful one would have been quite entertaining for all of you. I'm sure you would all laugh about it. I'm not going to spill the beans because I know what karma is like, and karma will get me at some point, and so I'm just going to be the one that just mentions the fact that there is a funny story relating to that camera, and I'm not going to be in any way, shape, or form the one to give it away because, well, like I say, these things come around and bite you, and I don't want to be bitten. Thank you. Anyway, we left Hosanna. We decided, well, I decided two things. One is we had a little look for him again, couldn't find him. Second is that he's given us so much of late that it just, I suppose, felt right just to leave him and let him go about his afternoon. He was clearly trying to get something or do something and explore, and us crashing around is never really going to help him that much if he is hunting. So it didn't feel right to go and bash around after where he had walked. And, you know, like I say, he's given us so much over the course of the last two weeks that it just, I suppose it's good just to let him have his own time from time to time, let him do his thing. And if he wants to be seen, he would have come right out into the open. And so I feel like we gave it a good shot and we had a good afternoon with him anyway. So, you know, we'll let him do his thing. I'm pretty sure he's going to end up coming back to one of the dams, either Gallego or even probably Juma little pan there, so the little pan in front of the camp, I wouldn't be surprised he turns up there at some point during the course of tonight, it wouldn't surprise me at all. He's got dikers to hunt, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly the population of diker gets filled by his culling, because as he's been killing, I wonder how fast it's going to be until others start moving in. There's still quite a lot around, I've seen lots at... Um, around the sort of pan area on quarantine there's quite a few there so it seems as though he's still kind of got lots to go through before he finishes them all but you know it'll be interesting to see whether or not he gets to a point where there's no more in this area i suppose it has to at some point you can't just keep picking them off at the rate that he is and they're going to be a never-ending cycle of them they've got to have to unfortunately disappear at some point now I've just come on to quarantine because I'm trying to find out jackals so I'm trying to look for the two jackals that are around here so hopefully we'll get a bit lucky there's also the honey badger that apparently has been seen a few times in this area so I'm gonna have a look for those while I do that let's send you back to spotlight out and is shining about yes now I want to find a honey badger every thought I had in my head moments ago is gone Tristan Gone. Honey badger, honey badger, wait. <laughs> we saw some tracks this morning, um, but it was just such a bumper show that it was impossible to talk about them. So, um, yes, we could find one. I'd love to find one. Uh, bear in mind, I'm probably going to do backward somersault in my chair 
if we do find one, because uh, I have not seen one yet in the Sabi Sands. So that would be great to see. And yes, we got those jackal on the drone the other morning. Managed to get James there. They were sitting in the open. Nice to see them. Fergus actually uh, sort of looked, he was flying the drone. He's like, they look like jackal. And I was like, yeah, they could be jackal. And James went in and in his very regal voice told us they were indeed jackal. You can imagine. We were quite excited. We don't see jackal very often around here. Might be because uh, leopards like to eat them, perhaps. Kathy, you would like a bush baby? Oh, well, we will keep our eyes peeled for the bush baby. If we want a bush baby, then we're going to have to go down this way. That's my thoughts. Staying up on the top here will not provide a bush baby. They tend to be more, in the, more down in the drainage lines. <clears throat> There's more trees, more activity, more gum and sap, and also more sort of things for them to, to sleep in during the daytime. There's not too much cover up here on the slope with regards to the trees. And also moisture from the trees down in the baseline, a little bit more prominent than the ones up here. They have quite a sort of fetish for acacia trees, gum trees. Used to find lots of them up in the fever tree forest up in the northern Kruger. It's a magnificent area up there. It's about 17 kilometers of just fever trees. Magical. You feel like you're in a in a fantasy movie when you go in there. And, they are at a bounds with um, with bush babies who like to to gnaw open the bark and feed on the sap that comes out. And I have uh, I've done that a few times, but it's got no flavour at all, no flavour. So it's like maple syrup without the without the maple. I don't know without the sweetness, just this bland goo. Well, Lisa's not bitter. You've seen me eat all sorts of nasty things. My bush babies absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Okay. Well, I think Tristan's just on that side over there. On the quarantine side. He's probably sitting very still at the moment. Listening out for any movement and alarm calls. Let's go see. I was listening out. I was also trying to just see if I can find these jackals. So I was just spotlighting around. This is where I find them quite often is this middle road of quarantine up against this kind of loop here. So they often sit around this section and that is why I spend a lot of time just stopping here and looking around because I'm quite curious as to where they go during the day. I want to know whether they go into a den or they in a thicket or what is happening with our jackals so that's why I spend a little bit of time in this area now apparently Jamie says that I can retell this story to all of you because well we're not going to be going back to her and she says that she would rather I say it anyway and basically what happened was is the cup cam is in a very low angle in a low place and a, a place where well very nice for cubs obviously in front there now Jamie got completely that the cub cam had been installed and what happens in the Mara is that you spend a long time out in the Mara and that means that you get a little bit in need of going to the bathroom and so what happened was Jamie got out the car merrily whistled her way to the front of the vehicle completely forgetting that cub cam was in action and the boys in FC were watching cub cam and well you can imagine the rest of the story is poor Jamie ended up going to the bathroom and then realizing halfway through that oh no what is happening and I can only imagine the shock and horror that was happening to Edwin and Martin in FC because both of them are the biggest gentlemen in the world and I'm pretty sure that they were <laughs> and they were pretty sure that both of them were a bit baffled and Jamie apparently is saying what a fun time it was a fun time Jamie the rest of us all giggled and laughed about it because Jamie just sends me a message and says I've made a bit of a mistake and I immediately knew roughly what was going on and poor Jamie had to then tell Edwin and Martin I'm very very sorry please just block your faces and eyes and everything like that. but Edwin and Martin were very good sports about it they didn't bring it up again they didn't really talk about it at all but it was very funny poor Jamie was 
is I don't think she'll make that mistake again I'm pretty sure right well we're going to head off home now it's that time of the day while we do that let's send you back across to Steve with the one last little surprise Yo, I haven't found a bush baby but we're down in the bottom down in the depression now the temperature has dropped a, te a degree but it's still very nice has not been a cold day and I got James to come sprinting with me that's the highlight of my day it was very good very very good we both but it has been a really nice afternoon out today and I thank you for joining us one and all and from the Safari live team from myself Senzo, Tristan, Namara back up there doing their thing. Scott made a brief appearance. Jamie, thanks for the hyena. And Taylor doing her absolute best. Thanks from all of us this side, including FC. Uh, we're going to be live and bright and on show tomorrow morning. So we'll see you then. Have a beautiful evening. Thanks for the feedback. Good night. See you then.